I wonder how many hours I could get out of this concept. Hey guys, do you like Mario? I like Mario. Whether it's through his traditional platformers or through some of his party games, chances are you have a positive experience with this franchise. Lest we also forget how big the brand has gotten over the past few years. With the release of the theme park, the movie, the countless games that have been released and announced, while the Mushroom Kingdom never left the spotlight, it really feels like it's re-entering it in a whole new way the past couple of years. Which really led me to start reflecting on the franchise as a whole. And while it would be a lot easier of a job to talk about the mainline games, I thought I'd make it interesting and talk about the spin-offs. Yes, while Mario is synonymous with the running and jumping, I personally have found that the spin-off games are some of the most interesting and inspiration-filled entries in this series, and I think they deserve some time to be spoken about. The Mario spin-off games are some of the safest party games to go to in a pinch. They're simple, addicting, and above all else, chaotic. And considering just how well some of these sold, it really starts to show you just how significant they are to the franchise. But I think that's enough for the premise. So let's go over exactly what our objective is here today. Today I'm going to be going through almost every Mario spin-off game in his lineup. This will include the mainstream franchises such as Mario Kart and Party, to the slightly less popular sports such as golf and tennis, and all the way to the obscure titles such as Pit Cross and Jesus Christ! As long as the name of the game isn't running and jumping, we're going to be talking about it. However, for the sake of simplicity, there are about five groups of games that we're not going to be talking about, so let's go ahead and jump into those next. Category 1. First of which is going to be the RPGs. Personally, I adore almost all of the Mario RPG games, and given I love the genre in general as much as I do, I have a lot more to say about all of these games, given that they're some of my earliest introductions to the genre. So I want to maybe do a follow-up video covering all the RPG games in the future, but only if this video does well. So if that's something you're interested in, make sure to leave a like down below. Category 2. Second of which is going to be the extended Mario Universe games. This is going to include any games in the Mario Universe where Mario isn't the playable character. So this is going to include games like Luigi's Mansion, WarioWare, and Donkey Kong. Category 3 Mainline games. Okay, I might have lied when I said three aside from the mainline games. Basically, I just wanted to cover my bases here and elaborate on what I consider a mainline game, just so there's no discourse. And instead of spending four minutes explaining why Mario jumping can only happen in the main continuity, here are all the games I won't be talking about. Category so this is going to be a bit of a niche one, but I'm not going to be talking about the Game & Watch games. There's a lot of those, and honestly, I don't really know what to say about them other than they're Game & Watch games, so, uh, pass. And number five, games with Mario references in them. This one might be a bit tricky to explain, but I'm gonna give it a shot. These are essentially going to be games that have Mario references or costumes in them, like Tetris DS or Nintendo Land, where you're not actually playing as Mario, so I don't think it should count. Now, there are going to be a few exceptions to that rule going forward, but you'll see why. It's in the favor of an interesting conversation piece, not just, hey, look at the blocks fall down next to Mario, oh my fuck. And that essentially covers it. And hey, if for some reason you actually care about my opinions, at the end of the video, I'm going to be doing a top 10 best and worst games of all the spinoffs. So if that's something you're interested in, please stick around. With all that out of the way, hey there, the name's Joe Frederick. Go ahead and grab some snacks and drinks, because this is going to be a doozy. Welcome to the Ultimate Mario Spinoff Retrospective. Boy, howdy, do we have a long way to go, but no better place to start than at the beginning. Now, some of you might already be thinking of what the very first Mario spinoff is. Dr. Mario? Super Mario Kart? Nope, we need to go even further back to golf for the NES. Is what an idiot would say. Because for the longest time, people assumed that because the cover art had a fellow dressed in red with a mustache, this was Mario. What a stupid assumption to make. Well, leave it to the Japanese exclusive Captain Rainbow to prove us wrong. This fellow here, he's actually named Osan. So if golf for the NES isn't the first spinoff, then what is it? How many years until we get to Double Dash? 17. Fuck. So yes, in 1984, not only did Pinball launch for the NES, but around the same time, so did I Am A Teacher Super Mario Sweater. While Pinball had some loose Mario representation, IAA TSMS was a full-blown Mario-branded title. Neither games are really too much to talk about, though. It's Pinball and Sweaters here. They were interesting little titles, but neither of these really felt like they were a Mario-branded game, more so they were just games with Mario appearing in them. We're gonna have to
to go a little bit further before we start getting into familiar territory. It only took us five more years, but we finally got to some more interesting titles. It wouldn't be until 1989 until Mario made starring appearances in two Game Boy titles, Baseball and Alleyway. These were pretty half-baked Mario titles though. Baseball is a pretty standard baseball simulator that they just kind of slapped Mario and Luigi into, and Alleyway is just literally a breakout clone with Mario on the box. These are most definitely just games developed by Nintendo that they thought might sell better if Mario was plastered on the box. I will give Alleyway credit though since it at least has some Mario stages in it, but baseball just shows you this and expects you to blow a gasket in joy. I know it feels like we're flying through these titles really quick, but there's just honestly not a lot to talk about. Due to these games being the way that they are, I think it's fair to call this era of Mario spin-offs the cameo era. Where it wasn't exactly a spin-off game with wacky Mario characters and mechanics, but more just setting him in front of the screen and expecting the money to roll in. Though you technically are playing as him in some of these games, so they don't fall under rule number five. Which brings me to my next question. You ever look at someone and the thought crosses your head, God, I wish he would give me drugs. Dr. Mario does the unthinkable and gives Mario a college education. Connect enough with the same colored pills to get rid of these little viruses. This was most definitely made to capitalize on the success that Tetris had on the Game Boy. And while I fully believe the Dr. Mario brand has become its own thing as it's gotten more releases and representation over the years, I kinda really think this was just another one of those games they swapped Mario on and it actually did pretty good so it kind of became its own thing over time. But as its own, there's nothing really Mario about it other than, you guessed, it. Him. Like, does this game really scream Mario? No, but this game does. Dr. Mario would release both on the NES and Game Boy. And while the color-based puzzles definitely fit better for the NES, I often see people affiliate this game more with the Game Boy, which I think stems from the fact that it has a pick-up-and-play high-score nature that fits better on a portable console rather than a home console. The game is alright. It's definitely the most original thing we've covered this far, but I'm not super crazy about it though. Definitely doesn't stem from the fact I'm really, really bad at it. Flashing forward a year later, the world finally got its greatest question answered. What were to happen if this and this were put together? <gasps> Mario Golf, but not this Mario Golf, this Mario Golf. Yeah, so we got another baseball situation on our hands where this is just a basic sports simulator with Mario characters in it. Most people only really talk about this game because of the Smash skin and this will be Daisy's last appearance for nine years. Start your timers. Also coming out this year was Mario Teaches Typing. I honestly owe this game a lot as before I had played it for this video, I was giving Adam these notes and little scribbles and pictures on papers. This game was clearly made for younger audiences, and it sure helped thousands of kids in the 90s learn how to not only type, but maybe even read and write. This game is just a lot more interesting to look at nowadays given how sanitized the Mario games have become in the past 20 years. Man, sure this game might not look the best, it really is interesting looking back in retrospect. It's like a car crash you can't keep your eyes off of, but instead of a car, it's Mario. And instead of another car, it's Mario. And instead of another car, it's Mario. And instead of a- <laughs> The game also puts in a lot of effort to give this game that classic Mario flair. Recognizable locations, characters, and mini games that harken to the original. It's surprisingly okay. While we're on the MS-DOS, let's put that printer to use. You can't be serious. How can you be doing a Mario spin-off retrospective and not no. talk about the Super Mario Bros. Print World game? It's the definitive Mario spin-off experience, trust me. Why are you even talking about this? I just gave you a whole Sonic- Mario movie. Print World is a technical marvel released to the Commodore 64, Apple Computer, MS-DOS, and even the Tandy 1000. Surely that's not a thing! In Mario Print, you get a print! Specifically, are from Super Mario Bros. 3 and Super Mario Land. Is this even a game? Hey look! You can even arrange the images to create the ultimate Mario image, ready for printing. Yup, there it goes. Man, this top right corner is gonna look great. You can even add borders and text. You get a section on this video, and you decide you want to talk about printing. You used an emulator for this. You won't even be able to print any of these. <laughs> I don't even want to know. Print World is a game that's not really a game, but sure is a Mario spin-off, and grants hours of endless fun. Unless you can only afford to put so much ink into your printer, then you may struggle in the late game. And for the final Mario release of 1991, just shows Nintendo will do literally anything for money. <laughs> 
understanding the brand potential. I would submit my best time to speedrun.com, but just like the supposed evidence against me, it's not there, making me the number one Mario Bros. Print World player and an innocent man in the eyes of the law. How do I even segue that into 1992 when all you did was talk about printing? <laughs> God damn it. Flashing forward to 1992, we finally are getting some recognizable titles here. We have the first installment of the series that is the poster child for the Mario spin-offs, Super Mario Kart. Now, I've talked a decent amount about Mario Kart in the past already, but now that we're getting into some of the more significant titles, these are when these reviews are going to be a bit lengthier. With the release of Super Mario Kart, we are officially moving out of the cameo and more into the humble beginnings era. I'm sure Adam is going to make some really cool graphics to split these up. The flavored era is still fairly simple, but as the series is getting more and more games to work off of, it has more inspiration to pull from its previous titles. So while Super Mario Kart isn't going to be as colorful as something like Mario Kart Wii, it's starting to get there. While Super Mario Kart is easily the weakest in the franchise under a modern lens, it is a revolutionary title, especially for the time. This was the first time a racing game didn't really emphasize realism or speed, but instead focused more on wacky mechanics and colorful stages. Ages. Well, hey, at least we get to finally see what happens when we put Yoshi behind the wheel. <laughs> This was due to the game's development. In its earlier stages, it was meant to be a simple racing game with Mario just as an optional playable character, a la baseball or the fucking oh. tube game. But slowly over time, the team became attached to the idea of making this a Mario racing game, not just a racing game with the titular plumber as a cameo. When this swap came, many came to follow. Mario was known for his power-ups, right? Why not incorporate those as items? Let's make much more vibrant and cartoony-esque stages. Why stop in Mario? Let's get Luigi, Bowser, Peach, Donkey Kong, Son, I don't give a fuck. The game was a massive success, and while it sits near the middle of the sales charts when compared up to all its sequels, it's still a really revolutionary game. It was practically the father of the term kart racer as its own defined racing genre of gaming. In the following years, many would try to capture the same charm as the Mario Kart franchise, and while some would find their own success and learn to deviate and do their own thing, many just didn't get what made the original so special and taught the world it takes more than a lot of recognizable characters and some items to make a good kart racer. So we owe this game a lot. Although I'm just gonna say it, the Shrek racing game for the GameCube does laps around this game any day of the week. As for itself in isolation, it sure is the first Mario Kart game. Yeah, maybe I'm just a tad bit spoiled with some of the later entries, but still an amazing game, no doubt about it, but it just feels a little rough. But I'll give it this though, getting the highest creativity score on the list so far. Slowing things down from burning the rubber, let's talk about Mario Paint. The game was made to take full utilization of the SNES mouse and provide kids with a painting program, similar to those found on computers at the time. What could have just been a very simple application with just maybe a few Mario stickers or something thrown on top of it became so much more. There were countless secrets to discover in the little game. So many toys tucked away modes to fiddle around with, but none were greater than that of the music creator. This was the most exposure I had to the game as a kid. Just seeing so many talented musicians creating some bonkers covers of songs using this over 25 year old program, it's insane. I wouldn't be surprised if this game served more as a tool for budding musicians rather than artists. The game was just such a fucking gem. It's honestly my favorite game we've covered on the list so far, and I haven't even fucking played the thing. And I really wish I could talk about it for, I don't know, maybe another two minutes. And two minutes is all I need to sell you Super Mario Brothers and Friends when I grow up. My better judgment tells me to stop you now, but on account I need you to record more DOS footage, my hands are tied. The first of many art games we'll be seeing today, When I Grow Up, is a digital coloring book with a ton of images, showing Mario and his friends in different occupations. Here he's a doctor, then he's a business executive, and here he is as the hero of Hyrule. When I say coloring, it's more the fill bucket is your only choice of tools here, but there's a ton of images, so you're not exactly limited for choice. I even used it to forge documents, proving I was at the cinema on April 16th at 9.27 in the morning, as I was buying and then watching the Super Mario Brothers movie. <laughs> I can't be in two places at once, can I? Do I need to report you to someone? But that's enough about painting and coloring in. Am I ever gonna get the answers on that April 16th thing? Adam, you can't edit this conversation! 1993 was a very interesting year for Mario when it came to his spin-off titles. We're going to see a definite shift in, uh... Well, let's just get right into it. Slam dunking us into the year was Mario is Missing, which was yet another educational stab at kids. Wait. No, that's not, <laughs> that's not how I should say it. 
was yet another educational game designed for kids. And by kids, I mean 55 year old historians that have nothing better to do with their life. You play as Luigi. Wait, come on, almost. <laughs> Fuck! As I was saying, you play as Green Mario in the real ass not mushroom kingdom -y streets of New York as you run around reading newspaper, answering trivia, all in the pursuit of finding your brother. I mean, I guess it's neat. It attempts to make some more Mario-esque designs like stomping Koopas, riding Yoshi, but then you see Bowser's sprite at the end of the game and you remember God is a lie and this game is bullshit. I don't know, man. I can't stomach this one for long, which is really great considering they made another one of these games in less than a year, Mario's Time Machine. I will give it credit for being the first and last Mario game to have Abraham Lincoln as a selling point on the front of the box, it's just the same damn thing as Mario is missing. I'll give it a little bit of credit for being at least a bit more interesting since you're traveling through time and locations across the world, talking to historic figures and having this little time surfing section, but come on, man. Aside from a Yoshi first person shooter outing, we have one more game, Mario vs. Wario. Mario vs. Wario follows Mario going on a casual stroll when Mario decides to plop a hat on him, which we all know Mario hates hats. So he wanders around like an idiot, so the random pixie can guide him through a variety of obstacles so he can get to Luigi, who's just kind of schmaltzing up there waiting to do something better with his life than being Mario is missing. I don't know what Detroit is, but I've had enough of it. This game is honestly pretty okay. It was another one that was designed to be played with the SNES mouse, but you can find ROM hacks of it online that have it rebounded for controller support. We would actually come to see this concept return in some form with the Mario vs. Donkey Kong series, but we won't be covering those games today. That will be saved for the Donkey Kong retrospective video. But it's a shame. I feel like there's a lot that could have been done with this concept, but eh. It's fine for what it is. Just when I thought that was all there was gonna be to talk about in 1993, I actually stumbled upon another game. Although it's not as traditional as a home console game, but it's actually an arcade game. In 1993, some arcades in Japan had this game called Mario, and I'm really sorry about this pronunciation, Undakai. Undakai. The game had a variety of mini games that could be played with this little DDR looking pad. Whenever a player would win a game, the machine would distribute a trading card. What the fuck that owns? These cards are pretty seldom found at this point, and the ones you can find fetch for a pretty hefty price. All in all, it's a pretty cool little machine. I kind of wish they revisited this idea of giving out trading cards with their Sonic Olympic arcade machines they did, but we'll get to those later. Honestly, I was getting a little worried there. 1993 started off really poorly. I was sure we were in for a dud year, but Mario vs. Wario and surprisingly Mario Undekai of all things brought it up a notch. Maybe Nintendo was really starting to find their footing with these games and shying away from these educational games opting for more colorful gaming experiences. So let's just look at the roundup for 1994 and I'm sure it's going to be- <laughs> So not only did we get three more education games, but a port of Mario's time machine? Also, okay, okay, there's a lot we need to talk about here. So we're gonna take this bit by bit. First of all, all three Mario early games are fine. They're meant to be educational games for young kids who have Mario. It's the standard early kid game of Dude, my phone, I'm in the middle of something. And as much as I would love to ignore it as it's not really a Mario game made by a different company, Company. Let's take a look at Hotel Mario. Help us. Hotel Mario follows both Mario and Luigi as they're invited over to hang out with the princess, but whoopsie doodle, Bowser has shown up. So it's up to Mario and Luigi to close a bunch of hotel doors. Look, in all honesty, this gameplay isn't miserable, it's just not fun. You run around, stomp enemies, and try to close a bunch of doors on each floor before the enemies can run downstairs and open up more doors. It's a novel concept, it's just not one that screams Mario. I remember one day on the bus to school when I was in fourth grade, there was a kid in fifth grade watching Super Mario Bros. Z on his 3DS, and he looked at me and said, you know, we could have had a game like this, but instead they chose to make Hotel Mario instead. And a day has not gone by where I've laid awake at night wondering how the hell he got that story. It's fine. It's stupid, but it's fine. I hope Koopas are involved. Pesky Luigi. Hopefully 1995 can salvage this, as it has a very low bar to cross. Luckily for us, 1995 was a lot more of an interesting year, starting us off with Undekai 30, same game Daisuken Mario version. The game I just said is a Mario puzzle game developed by Hudson Soft that was released in 1995 in Japan for the Super Famicom. This game can be controlled with either a standard joypad or the Super Famicom mouse. You you play by choosing to break as many symbols in a row as you can, trying to rack up the highest score. Finally, a game that incentivizes the slaughtering of the entire Yoshi race. 
The game was released to retailers to put out on display for players to track their highest scores as part of some competition. Aside from this, the game was later distributed through the Satel program. While a lot of these games would have lost the time, Daisuk and Mario version seems to be extremely accessible, as some of the distribution copies can be bought online through retail websites. We're going to be covering a lot more of these Satel view games, but we'll get there when we get there. However, if you bring this up at a party, this is the fastest way to be going home alone. You know what won't send you home alone? Mario Picross! The Picross franchise has always been around when it comes to Nintendo, but it wasn't until earlier this year when I tried the Pokemon version that I really kind of understood why it's so prevalent. It's a really charming little puzzle game. The gimmick of the game is you have a large grid with numbers on the vertical and horizontal plane that tell you how many squares need to be colored in on each line. It's kind of like if Sudoku was turned into an art game, if that makes any sense at all. It's a really hard game to pitch, and it might sound stupid, but they honestly make for great little bite-sized challenges. By the time you finish the puzzle, you'll find you've made a little picture. Mario Picross was the first of the Picross series, but its success led to a boatload of sequels for other Nintendo IPs. Now, personally, I usually can only stomach two or three of these games in a row before my brain needs more stimulating entertainment, but this was for the Game Boy in 1995. This was a game that you could still play on the train, in the car, in court, okay maybe not that last one, but my point still stands. The fact that the game was so easily accessible and had more Mario flair for younger audiences, I think this is a really bang up title. Unfortunately though, the game flopped commercially. I can't really blame it. This is a title I can really enjoy as an adult, but if I was playing this game as a kid, I would feel more like I was doing homework than a means to satiate the Danimals monkey running in my hamster cage I call a brain. So its sequel, Mario Super Picross, that's not the order I'd put those words in, was only released for the Super Famicom in Japan. It's roughly the same thing as the Game Boy Color, but now it had more horsepower for bigger pictures with the benefit of an actual color palette to work with. Following Mario Picross's release later that year, the world was blessed with- Typing is fun. Give me a break here! Oh, hell yeah, I fucking love typing. You know what? Fine, Mr. Typey Man, you fucking do it then! Well, okay then. Like before, we're back at Typing for Babies in Mario's next floating head adventure. I would love to spend ages talking about typing, but that's just not quite what this game is known for. Moving on the ground, moving on the ground. Mario Teaches Typing 2 takes Mario Teaches Typing 1 and does the the same thing. It's it's the same game. Only now, sometimes things happen, such as this ugliest sin cutscene, this ugliest scene cutscene, or Mario literally stops me being able to do anything in order to deliver a witty one-liner. What separates Teaches Typing 1 and Teaches Typing 2 is the platform they're on. See, Mario Teaches Typing 1 was for the MS-DOS, whereas its sequel is on Windows 95 and up. With that in mind, this one is actually harder to play, as the screen tearing means when I'm on a roll, I can't see what I'm actually supposed to type next. Another difference being Bowser's castle level. It now actually gets me to type relevant sentences about the keyboard. Unlike Mario Teaches Typing 1, who wanted to teach young typers about the Pearl Harbor attacks. Did you notice that? Because typing it sure made me notice. What's also fascinating is how Mario Teaches Typing uses the space key, as in this game- Are you done yet? It's spaces, the same as the first game, we can get a move on! Due to the you know what, buddy? I've got some keys for you. Given the Take a look at my two friends, Alt and F4. So <laughs> That'll take care of him for a while. Wait, who's gonna record the video? Well, no, you know what? I used to edit videos. I, I got this. Oh, well, thank God, it's Mario's Tennis. Finally, another sports game. Wait, I don't remember there being one before the 64. What console is this even? Virtual Boy comes with the Mario's Tennis Game Pack. 1995 started off so damn strong, dude. Forget this was the year when people all unanimously woke up and said, We, we don't, don't like our eyes. bowling. Do you sickos have no shame? Mario's Tennis was released as a pack-in title for the Virtual Boy. And yep, it's tennis. Now, personally, I'm playing these games on an emulator because... <laughs> But I've heard online that the 3D works for the game. Like, yes, they do have multiple characters and stages, but when the whole thing looks like this, it hardly makes any difference. In the Fixing Every Mario Kart roster video I made last year, I said this. Yeah, that's right, fuckers. Let's address the monkey in the room. Super Mario Kart featured Donkey Kong Jr. for the first and last time. Which ended up being incorrect because he does make an appearance here. With making such a blatant mistake, the result was obvious. Out of the ah. on that video, over half of them have nothing to do with Donkey Kong Jr. No one noticed because fuck him and fuck this game. All right, you know what? That was a drag. I'm gonna bring in my other two keys. Control and Z. Welcome back, Adam. To identify, a comma would be followed by one space. I'm already gonna regret this, aren't I?
At the chagrin of Mario's reputation and my head, we're going to continue on with the Virtual Boy with Mario Clash. This was supposed to be a new take on the classic Mario Brothers arcade game, but instead of having the option to play in multiplayer, it's now just a single player game, where Mario can jump between the foreground and background layers to trounce enemies. While the game itself isn't anything to write home about, I think it's pretty okay. The game was actually originally being developed as a minigame for the cancelled game VB Mario Land, but at some point in development I suppose they decided to make it its own standalone thing, and this game would have benefited so much from just being a mini game and a bigger title. Hell, if this was packed in with Wario Land on the Virtual Boy, I think it would have been received so much better. But as it stands now, it's mediocre at best. No! Making its second appearance in the video, we have another Satella View exclusive, Satella Q. There honestly isn't much to go off of this one. It was basically a quiz show that would air in Japan that would come on in between other programs. There would occasionally be little mini games where you move Toad around a pool table, but that's about all I could find. Jesus Christ, 1995 was packed, but we finally made it to the end with Mario's Fundamentals slash Game Gallery. The game was originally launched as Mario's Game Gallery, but the kids at home didn't really know what fun was, so the fun guys at Nintendo made sure the funny kids knew what fun was because it was fun! So what exactly is in Mario's Fundamentals? It's kind of just a really primitive Mario 64 casino game set. Lower the bitrate, turn Luigi red, and boom, bam, Mario's Fundamentals. It's just a collection of checkers, dominoes, backgammon, and go fish. What the fuck do you guys want me to say? Who in the crisp year of 2023 is going to make a checkers review? What is up, porn stars? It's your boy, Adam. Now today, I'm finally after mo- You know what? I'm just gonna let him do his own thing. It's easier to work with him than against him at this point. However, I will say I do adore the way that the chess game looks, with Bowser's stupid little waddle and how at the end of the game the Koopas and Baby Yoshi's high five like a job well done. Dude, Yoshi looks stoned to shit, bro. What's going to happen to him next? And with that, we're done with 1995. Honestly, this was a pretty all right year. Sure, we had some duds and smaller titles, but we did have some pretty major ones like Mario's Picross, and I'll even give some points to Tennis and Clash. We really are starting to see that they're running out of you utilize the potential of this IP, even if it's showing sparsely. Luckily for us, 1996 is going to be a pivotal turning point for the Mario spinoffs. This is going to be the year when Nintendo starts to barely, barely understand what a Mario spinoff could be. No longer are we stuck in the bland era, but we're going to start getting into the inspired era. Starting with... All right, I'm sorry. I know this is super anticlimactic, but we got to make a quick stop at Super Mario Attack really quick. It was yet another Japan exclusive arcade machine. The gameplay involves landing caped Mario and items who have different values and medals. The player have the option of doubling or tripling their bet. They must dive within 15 seconds. If the player dives into an enemy pit or runs out of time, they lose. If the player wins, Mario, Yoshi, and Princess Toadstool appear on screen. Did you get all that? Great! Because those two sentences I just spoke are all I could find on the Super Mario wiki of this game. 1996 had a boatload of other amazing Mario games coming out. But unfortunately, all of these are... It's finally time to talk about one of the biggest Mario spin-off releases of all time. It's the second installment in a franchise that you always think of when you hear the term Mario spin-off. That's right, folks. It's finally time we talk about Mario's Picross 2! Put it up in lights! Mario's Picross 2 is an improvement on the original in just about every way. Don't misunderstand. This is still the fundamentals of Picross. Now you're given four different modes. Easy Picross, Quick Picross, Mario Picross, and Yeah! Picross. That's right, there's actually two different story modes you can pick to play through here, with each having their own mechanics to change up the gameplay. And you even get to run around these little hub levels, and both the brothers are in these little architect outfits. It's really cute. While we're on side tangents, between this, Mario Clash, and Mario vs. Wario, I'm a little bit surprised at how often Wario was used looking at these things in hindsight. But aside from all this, this is just a really good Mario's Picross game, trouncing the first one in just about every way. There's more content, more gameplay modes, more goals to go towards, it's a good time. All right, all right. I know it was a pretty cheap move back there to tease you guys and then just hit you with Mario's Picross 2. So let's do this fair and square this time. Mario Kart 64. Now this is where the spinoffs start really making their impact. It only took us like 10 years, but we're finally here. 
While Super Mario Kart was definitely the first step down this path, Mario Kart 64 was really what pushed the ball rolling. The game improves on its predecessor in just about every way possible. More distinct tracks, better music, better visuals, a better fucking monkey! Where the original Mario Kart certainly still holds its merits, and over time it's gained its own aesthetic as it's been referenced in many other future titles, Mario Kart 64 was the first racing game that truly felt like you were racing in the Mario world. And while Super Mario Kart definitely has its fans, there's a reason the Mario Kart 64 community is as active as it is. I mean, hell, the speedrunning community for this game alone is a sight to behold. It just holds up so damn well. And while there isn't too much reason to go back to it nowadays, the impact the game had can't be understated. This game is just simply iconic. The only nitpick I can make is the amount of characters there are. Sure, 8 is a really good amount, but considering that some kart racers at the time were putting out 10, I feel like we really could have squeezed in two more. And if I were to pick, I would make them Koopa Troopa and Magikoopa, considering the prior has a stage in the game and was in Super Mario Kart, and the latter was in really late builds of the game, so I imagine it wouldn't be too much work. Mario Kart 64 is an amazing title here. I don't know how far it's going to make it up in the overall rankings, but for the time, this is the most inspired the Mario spin-offs have been. Now, unfortunately, we still do have a few dud titles to get through before we get to the real inspired era, but they're going to learn a lot from this game, and it's going to be seen easily going forward. But before we can get to any of those games, we need to make a quick pit stop in 1997 with one game. From one racing game to another, we find ourselves at Mario's Excite Bike. While there were other Mario games released this year, they all fall outside of the parameters of this video. So this is going to be the only one we're talking about. The game is actually called Excite Bike Bun Bun Battle. This was a remake of the original Excite Bike made for the NES, but now in full color with the coat of Mario all over it. The only problem was that, yet again, another Satellaview title. I'm not against this Satellaview, and I just think it's a cool machine back when it was supported, but I just kind of wish Nintendo would pull all of them from their backlogs and release a Satellaview collection or something just for the preservation of it all. But honestly, it's Excite Bike, but Mario, I don't have much to say here. Let's move on. Oh boy, is 1998 going to be a great year. But before we can get into why that is, we first need to make a quick stop. Wrecking Crew 98. Wrecking Crew 98 is a spiritual successor to the NES game, simply titled Wrecking Crew. Though it shares many of the same design elements and gameplay mechanics, the gameplay itself is pretty different. Instead of this platformer game, it's more of a general puzzler type thing. The game like Mario Picross 2 was only ever released in Japan. It was released on the Wii U, but again, only in Japan. What the hell, Nintendo? Let the Americans have it! Eggplant Man, damn it! It's pretty cool to see some of those original characters in a more modern art style, so I'm not really gonna hate on this one, but there's a reason we haven't really seen a return to Wrecking Crew 98. Or Wrecking Crew in general. To be honest, I think only 3% of the population knew who Spike was when they saw the Mario movie. It's a me! Alright. Got through 98, what's coming up? Quest I Forget, the second most popular Mario spin-off, and dare I say, THE party game to end all party games, Mario Party. The Mario Party games are the de facto titles to pull out at your friend's house, which will either make for one of the best nights of your lives, or as others call it, the night of the incident. <laughs> the game plays as a virtual board game where you and three of your soon-to-be ex-friends must roll the dice, grab some coins, and race around the board using items and shortcuts to buy power stars. After every round, all players partake in a minigame where the winner receives coins that can be used to better their chances on the board. By the end of the turn limit, the game will be decided by who has the most amount of stars. This all sounds fairly simple, but Mario Party has a few tricks oh up its sleeve. God. You know how Monopoly is pretty infamous for having pretty heated moments? Show of hands. I'm counting three, uh, four. Oh my goodness, is there five back there? Six. Mario Party has that shit every five minutes. This can come from random and hectic nature of minigames, some bullshit event square on the map, or just feeling of spending four turns rushing to the star and having someone run up and get it right as it's within your reach. But of course, I'd much rather show than tell. So here's an example of the kind of bullshit the game can throw at you. Uh, side note, this is from Mario Party 6 footage, but trust me, you'll want to see it regardless. <laughs> Give me that oh, star. At a certain point, you have to question who it comes <laughs> No way. Come on. Are you kidding me? Oh my god. <laughs> Let's see it. Come on. One. 
course, this was the make or break aspect for most people when this game came out, considering how much bullshit is crammed into this tiny little cartridge. While some reviews came out positive, there were others that lambasted the title for just how unfair the game was. Skill issue, I, I don't know what else you want me to say. As for the Mario flair on this concept, they really hit it out of the park this time. Boards and mini games have Mario themes and characters scattered about them. You use mushrooms to increase your dice rolls, and every board is designed around each playable character. Most of these make sense, like DK Jungle, Yoshi's Tropical Island, and even Wario's Battle Canyon. Because you know this fucker is constantly at war with his demons. But the funniest thing to me is Luigi's engine room? Up to this point in time, we hadn't really seen much personality from Mario or Luigi. So while a Mario 64 rainbow cruiser map makes sense for Mario, when it came to Luigi, I can only imagine they had made it to this stage and ran out of characters, so they just slapped my boy on it. Even in the game, the text says this is an engine room. What kind? I have absolutely no idea. So like, come on, it'll be a few years before Luigi gets the gusto we know him for. Maybe this is predating his talent with vacuums? I, I don't know. There just is so much this game got right. However, I'd be remiss not to mention the major flaw this game had and why it's somewhat become infamous under today's standards. I won't waste much time on it as I'm pretty sure it's common knowledge at this point and especially if you're watching this video, but the game had a design problem with some of its mini games. Some mini games encourage the players to spin the analog stick in a circle and based on the way the N64 controller is shaped, it led to players using their palms, which of course led to a huge lawsuit with kids burning holes in their hands and gloves being sent out to anyone who wrote in. All right, that's one of the three things I needed to check off of the talk about Mario part list, so let's keep going. Mario Party is going to be coming up just about every year from this point forward. It was a massive success, even if the reviews weren't even the best at the time, but Nintendo really felt like they could have done better, which is why they followed it up with Mario Party 2, which we'll get to in a minute, but this is going to start a trend, so expect for me to talk about these games a lot more coming up in the video. I'm not gonna go over them in depth as much as I did this one, just kinda talk about how they improved or changed things up from game to game, but these games are synonymous with Mario Kart as being the two pillars of spin-offs. I'm excited to see what they followed up Mario Party with. Painting. Uh, I'm sorry, what? Did you say painting? Mario no Photopi. Painting. Oh, well, that's great. You love painting. All you've done is draw for this entire video. Why is Mario a plumber if he clearly prefers art? To be fair to the game, it's actually quite an interesting one, as this Japanese exclusive cartridge had a slot for a smart media card, a storage card that you could now call the grandparents to SD cards, as it was only used in cameras no longer in use. This was your way to import your images from your camera to then edit them in Mario no Photopi. This is also known as one of the more infuriating games to emulate because it just doesn't really work. So a huge shout out to Jay Contra for the detailed video on this game, which I'll say now has a much better video on this topic than this little bit will ever do. I'm genuinely not kidding. The footage you're seeing now is from an hour of tweaking Project 64 just to get my footage, which is a bit... There's a slideshow function and a tile minigame, but otherwise it's MS Paint for the Nintendo 64. But there is also still a working website for this game. It's funny because I can actually read none of this, but I do wish this little guy a happy birthday. Quote to met, and now I'm bored of painting. Joe, let the painting end, please. All I see is brushes and colors, brushes and colors, brushes and colors, brushes and colors. All right, I just had a talk with Adam. He's gonna sit the next couple plays out. I, I think all these really bad educational games have really burnt him out. So uh, let's just move on to 1999. Uh, hey, future Joe here. Uh, Joe from like eight months after this part of the video was recorded. We originally were going to talk about Super Smash Bros. 64 and all of its subsequent games and compare how much Mario was represented with his characters and stages, but this video is taking forever. And if we try to do that, that's gonna add like an extra 15 minutes to the runtime. So we're gonna save that topic for a future video talking about the most represented franchises in all the Smash Brothers games. But in the meantime, we're going to start off with Mario Golf. Golf 64. Mario Golf 64 takes the concept of what if we put this and <laughs> wait, hold on. I'm sorry to break script again immediately, but I'm realizing I wrote the same joke I wrote for Mario Golf back on the NES for Mario Golf 64. And uh, I'm not good at this YouTube thing. Am I? Yeah, so Mario Golf for the N64 is where this subsection of Mario spinoffs really starts to come into its own. No longer are we restricted to 2D environments and we can play golf in the third dimension. By today's standards, the gameplay is a little bit rigid, but it's still pretty enjoyable and would get the job done if it's all you had. Let's just boot it up and hop right in. I can't wait to play as a week. Huh. Yeah, so the roster of Mario Golf 64 starts off a little bit interesting. Out of all these characters, 
you choose these four to be selectable out of the box. And while on the subject, who are all these kids? Did the Rugrats break out? I thought they were still in France! Yeah, so it turns out for some reason the fellas down at Camelot thought it would be just a great idea to make this Mario game have half the roster filled up with original characters. Because God forbid our parents let us play with yogurt and Walmart. I kind of get that Plum has kind of become a staple in the Mario sports games at this point, but we couldn't have at least gotten Mario out of the box? To my knowledge, this is the only time a Mario game has made a Mario an unlockable character. As for the gameplay, it's a no thrills golf game, and I'm very, very bad at it. <laughs> Fuck! However, this game did introduce a lot of elements that would come to future Mario sports games. There were different types of golf, such as ring golf, where you have to hit the ball through a bunch of rings before getting to the flag, and speed golf, where you have to try to rush through all the holes as fast as possible. This mode will come on to take a new light in about 20 years, but we'll get there when we get there. It also has this cute little opening cutscene of all the characters golfing. And one final piece on top of the cake, there were four additional unlockable characters if you connected your Game Boy to the N64. Wait. Game Boy version? Oh god. Turns out that Mario Golf 64 is a double entry. Mario Golf, no 64, just GB. GB, get golfing. Yep, this is Mario Golf on the Game Boy, all right? All things considered, I think it holds up pretty well. Sure, you don't have as many characters to choose from, and you lose some models from the N64 release, but you do get a full-blown RPG story mode. Yeah, look at this, you gain experience, you run around talking to characters. This is pretty cool. Honestly, a super sick way to tackle a handheld version of the game. This doesn't seem like a handheld game trying to be a console game. That just ends up failing and disappointing. Adam, I'm super positive Sega has done this at some point with Sonic. Just to throw up some of that on the screen while I'm talking here. Okay, thanks. But they instead opted to make it its own thing. Kind of playing more like a board game overhead golf thing. Like, th this is a thing, I, I swear. Like, tabletop golf games? I know it was in Clubhouse games. Uh, Adam, prove me right here, please. In a funny way, I think there's really some advantages this game has over the console release. I think it makes for a much better single player experience, as opposed to the N64, which is way better for multiplayer co-op. There's merits to both versions of the game, and I think that's really impressive considering the state of handheld games at the time, especially when it came to those that were adaptations of console games. And what can I say? I'm just a fan of the genre. Seriously, guys, the Mario RPG video will somehow end up being longer than this one. Just do wait. I'm obsessed with RPGs. You know what I'm not big on, though? Uh, art. If it means I'm the one doing the art. Um, hey, Adam? Can you not just do it? Nope, nope, sorry. Too busy. Uh, big business. Fable Top meeting. Uh, g gotta go! He's next. Released for the Japanese exclusive Nintendo 64 disk drive, we have more painting. But look, this one comes with pre-rendered images to paint over. Who knows what we'll have by the year 2025. This wasn't even Nintendo's only attempt for something like this on the 64DD, as there were two other Mario Artist games, that being Talent Studio and Polygon Studio, the former being a tool to make a character, then apply basic animations over, and the latter being a simple 3D model maker with WarioWare style minigames of all things. These are super cool in concept, but like the other games, condemned to a Japan only failure of a system. This isn't even the last painting game here. What am I supposed to say at this point? Just go paint! Draw your favourite Dragon Ball character or something, I don't fuck know. There's not even any printing compatibility, so if anything, we're going backwards. Even Sonic- Not yet. Goddamn 1999 has been a killer year! As you'll soon start to notice, with the major success Mario Party had on the console, and the major failure Mario Party had on the console, Nintendo wanted to not only strike while the iron was hot with the initial buzz, but also desperately try to make a new version of that game that would kind of distract people from some of the lawsuits that came with the first- So Mario Party 2 was born! Mario Party 2 was an improvement in a lot of ways. For starters, it was sending a lot of us kids to the hospital, but other than that, let's get into the other ones. For starters, instead of opting for character themed boards, because I swear I think they would have blown a gasket trying to come up with another Luigi board. Luigi board? The Luigi board? What does he do? They instead went for more of a varied, almost movie genre boards. We've got space, pirates, cowboys, archaeology, horror, and my personal favorite genre of entertainment, Bowser. These boards are a real treat, and I think a better spread compared to Mario Party 1. But I, of course, would be remiss not to mention the biggest improvement Mario Party 2 had on Mario Party 1, and still an improvement none of the other games have capitalized on. And that's the fact that all the characters get these cute little costumes depending on the board they're playing on. 
I haven't really gotten to play too much of the N64 games when it comes to proper couch co-op, but what I have played, I've enjoyed. Mario Party 2 comes up short in a lot of ways. No new characters, same amount of boards, and a boatload of reused minigames. But despite all that, I think it accomplished its goal pretty well. Let's be real, this was never going to be the second Mario Party, but more of an update to Mario Party 1. And in that regard, I think it did really well. Got rid of some of the more boring minigames and brought in some new ones while keeping some of the fan favorites there. Overall, it's really good. And while there's some charm to 1, I think this is definitely an improvement on the formula. Now to segue from the most popular Mario spin-off series into the quite literally least popular Mario spin-off series, Picross NP. How do I know it's not popular? Because it is no longer a Mario spin-off series. In 1999, the game Picross NP came out and it was exclusive to Japan, again. This one was really cool though. Picross NP was distributed in eight packs through the Nintendo Power Magazine. And these packs were varied as hell. They included Pokemon, Donkey Kong, Wario, Ocarina of Time, Mario 64, and it has never been localized? I fully understand me and maybe, I don't know, Scott the Waz and Z Gamer dudes are the only f**ks in the United States who give a damn about Picross, but man, throw us a bone, Nintendo. Re-release these as a collection on the eShop or even through the Nintendo Online service. But hey, what are we gonna do? Hey, uh, you still there? Man, looking at the time, it's uh, been quite a while now. But I guess in that amount of time, we've covered 16 years of Mario spinoffs. We still have uh, 23 to go. Oh God, I really hope it's not 24 by the time I finish this. You all still comfortable, right? You good on the food and drinks? Great. Well, before we continue, we actually do have a bit of a sponsorship to talk about here. It, it's me, I, I'm the sponsorship. <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna dawdle on it too long, and here's a timestamp up on screen of when you can skip to to just get back into the action, but in case you didn't know, I actually do things other than YouTube. It's shocker, I know. Starting last year, I actually started my own tabletop productions company called uh, Fable Top Production. Get it? it? It's a joke because it's like Fable and Tape. Basically, if you're not sure what this means, is if you know anything about d and I've got a small team that makes games like that. We currently only have the one game out right now, Dread of Night, but it's doing really well for itself. I won't go too hard on the sell here, but if you've ever wanted to get into d and or any of that kind of genre of gaming, but want something really simple and easy to understand to jump in, that would be what Dread of Night's purpose is. It's a dark fantasy monster hunting system where all of the classes are inspired by different video games, movie, and anime that pertain to that genre. Dark Souls, Berserk, The Witcher, Demon Slayer, and a few more. I'm going to be leaving some links in the description below, but if you wanted to support me in any kind of way, I don't really have a Patreon. I feel a little bit weird asking for subscriptions like that, but if you want something tangible that you can hold in your hands, and you know it's made by the same guy who talked about Luigi for almost three hours, that would be the place to do it. And this isn't going to be a one and done project. We have a second book that's going to be launching around this March on Kickstarter, and it's going to be a really good time. It's done in the art style of The World Ends With You, which if there's any uh, uh, Hecto Pascals out there who know what that is, uh, you're, you're going to be excited for that one. But in the meantime, I've dawdled on long enough. Let's get back into talking about Mario and his funky little friends. The first spin-off title of the new decade was none other than Mario Tennis for the N64. And like golf, in a few months came to follow a GBA port. Playing both games back to back, you can really tell tennis followed the framework golf laid out to a T. It's a golf joke. For starters, we've got this wacky opening cutscene that introduced all the characters in the game. And god damn do we have two major appearances. Yep folks, it's finally time to stop your stopwatches. We finally get to talk about the return of the legends themselves. Waluigi and Paratroop. Alright, fine, we can talk about Daisy. Hi, Daisy. This was the first appearance we got from the princess of Saraha 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 Saraha. I'm finally alive. It was only fair. Peach needed a partner for tennis. I thought she was with Toad. Oh, Adam, you silly fuck. He obviously has to play with baby Mario. You know, the bearing as ancient as time. But let's not sell someone short here. On top of this being Daisy's grand return to the Mario franchise, this was also the introduction of everyone's boy, Waluigi. I really like this part in the intro cutscene where they really give him a good amount of screen time to make his presence known. As for the game itself, oh god, I put it's pretty alright, um... It is pretty unobjectable. 
for starters, there's no incessant monkey screaming in my ear every literal four seconds. <laughs> but it's pretty standard tennis for the most part, but it controls pretty okay. Nintendo learned from their mistakes of golf by not making half the cast my distant cousins and including some bonus modes from the other games, such as Ring Rally, a variation of the ring mode in golf, but now with every character having a set of challenges unique to them. There also is this Piranha Plant weird competitive score-based game and a mode where you play on Bowser's Castle with a bunch of power-ups. Neither of these did really anything for me in the grand scheme of things, but I'm glad they were there. And they're definitely showing a little bit of this idea of fun mini games and bonus modes that you wouldn't find in other sports games. It's very bare bones here and not fun, but we're getting there. The game does have some very minor setbacks. For starters, when queuing up in doubles, your partner is decided for you, which is pretty lame. But it's only made worse when your partner AI is dumb as bricks. I found myself constantly having to rush to whatever position he was trying to fill, because whatever I left him to do on his own, it always ended up like this. The only thing that kept me sane during this whole endeavor was how absolutely smitten I was with Mario's voice. I swear, man, just like Bowser, this is the cutest we've ever seen or heard Mario. Another thing, though, is the court variety is pretty slim. The most you get in this game are just a bunch of different renders of the characters over the grass. Now, while the Donkey Kong court should be a series staple, I just feel like I was a little disappointed by this, because this game is clearly the precursor to what I deem the golden age of Mario spinoffs. All the elements are here, fun side modes, loads of characters, tight gameplay, Usually wacky courts with crazy modifiers are kind of what I expect, but I suppose it's going to take them an extra year or two to fully get there. But let's not fault the sins of the son to the father. And I enjoyed my time with it a lot, more than I did with golf. This is definitely where the sky started to look a little bit brighter for the sports games, as Nintendo has clearly started to find their footing with what they want to do with this IP. And honestly, I don't really have too much to say for tennis on the Game Boy. It's got a better single player experience for the most part, although I do want to give Tennis 64 a little bit of credit for the ring rally missions, but it's a really good passable RPG and I've heard this one is better than golf, so I'm going to give that a little bit of merit. I know I kind of glazed over it, so here's a few seconds of footage. All right, you're all set. Let's move on. Mario Party 3 time, baby! Unlike Mario Party 2, which felt more like an updated Mario Party 1, the third installment of the franchise branches out and makes a lot of strides. For starters, not only do we have 70 brand new mini games, a fact they found so impressive they slapped it on the front of the box so no one thought this was Mario Party 1.3 edition, but we finally get some new characters into the mix. Waluigi and Daisy make their series debut. Get a good look at this lineup, everyone, because these are the characters that are going to remain constant for the rest of the Mario Party franchise. Constant. Alongside them, we got two pretty significant new modes. A dual mode where two competitors face off with an ally outside of the roster, like a Koopa, Toad, or... This mode even comes with its own slew of boards. However, no one really ever talks about the dueling game. And to be honest, I can kind of see why. While I think it's incredibly inventive, I mean, hell, there are combat stats in a Mario Party game. It kind of plays like a washed down version of the main game. You're basically limited to only the dual mini games, which is cutting off a massive portion of the game on its own. There's no stars and you're fighting for coins and to keep your health up, which is fine. But when there's two of you running around the board, it can make this drag really long. And if I'm sitting there in the year 2000 at the age of negative two, and I want to play a multiplayer game with one friend because you're only playing with one friend to play this mode not only do you have or even get this the main mode of the game because it's still fun if there's just two of you oh oh give me a s yeah a few moments later R race no you <laughs> <laughs> but of course, we all know why this mode is here, right, Allie? I know you're watching this. I know you're listening to this in the background. So go ahead, Allie. Why don't you tell everyone why this mode is here, Allie? The campaign mode. Story modes are usually seldom found in Mario Party games, usually because, well, they don't need to exist. And I want to play a single player game on my N64. I would more likely go for it. Not. The campaign is centered around the Millennium Star. It's said that those who obtain its power will become the world's greatest superstar for the rest of their lives. 
One day the gang is hanging out when the Millennium Star comes crashing down, and despite the franchise constantly trying to pitch these guys as a group of best friends, they are immediately at each other's throats. I swear, Nintendo knows how ruthless Mario Party can get, given how hostile the group is whenever they're depicted in these games. Finally, the Millennium Star pops up and tells the group that he's going to hold a competition, and whoever wins will get to harness his blessings. He will hold seven competitions across the Mushroom Kingdom, where the winner can obtain seven stamps. The person to collect all seven stamps will be claimed the victor. Wait, seven magic MacGuffins that will grant someone's wish. Adam, I know what you're thinking, but don't do it. The game follows a pretty simple pattern. You win a basic Mario Party game, you are about to get given the stamp, someone jumps in and tries to claim it, so the two of you have to go to a dual board, you beat them to a pulp, and claim the stamp. Cue funny Bowser cutscene. You do this long enough until you get to the top, where you're about to square off with Bowser himself for the mischief stamp. When, actually, Waluigi actually stands up and beats him, and becomes the makeshift final boss? He even takes you to Waluigi Island, which is even funnier, considering every character in the game has a stage based off of them in the franchise up to this point, except for Dave. Between Waluigi being considered the main antagonist, and him being the only character to not be a written rival, I think he's meant to be the canon protagonist of the story. This is even supported by the fact during the opening cutscene, he's the only one not big over who deserves the star. He's a man of no sin! Unlike his putrid pals, he isn't being weighed down with the sins of vanity, greed, and wrath. Luigi is the second coming of Christ! Turns out the Millennium Star was a fraud, so uh... Mario Party 3 was an excellent succession to the Mario Party formula. It brought with it many new ideas and concepts that would either be carried over or expounded on in the future of the franchise. Through its inclusions of characters, modes, and minigames, it really set a precedence for what each Mario Party game should be introducing. However, it does kind of get lost in the sauce of its two older brothers. I think it's a pretty good game, if not better than the first two. It definitely has more creative energy put behind it, but it is the final N64 Mario Party game. Going forward, they are going to look a lot different and play pretty similar. It's it's gonna be Mario Party for a few more years. <laughs> So going into 2001, we have only one more Nintendo 64 game to talk about. That being Dr. Mario 64. It should be stated that it's been a whopping 10 years since I've covered this franchise. And well, that's just because there isn't too much to talk about. Dr. Mario saw some simple releases and pack-ins such as Tetris Combo in 1994, but Dr. Mario 64 was the first official sequel to the original. So let's see how it holds up for its 10 year anniversary. Well, for starters, this game looks phenomenal. The N64 rarely ever did anything in 2D, or even a pixel art style for that matter. Which fair, your whole company projection chart was based off of this, not this, but when they did decide to hone in on their roots, they made some good looking stuff. Even Paper Mario, that was primarily a 3D looking game, looked great in its 2.5D art style. One of the major improvements 64 had over the original was how it found its home place on a console by utilizing its multiplayer mode. You can go head to head with up to four friends in fast paced Dr. Mario gameplay here. And since the Dr. Mario franchise is its own thing, we got a slew of unique characters you wouldn't find in any other Mario game. Smash, smash, pass, 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 smash, pass, pass, smash, smash, pass, 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 smash, <gasps> ULTRA SMASH! On top of a refined multiplayer experience with way more modes than the original offered, there are now two full blown campaign modes where you either play as Dr. Mario or Wario? Yeah, I was kind of wondering why he was up there a minute ago. I'm telling you, this guy was everywhere back in the day. Weirdly enough, this game is heavily influenced by Wario Land 3 of all games, with both its characters and its narrative. The big bad of the game is Rudy the Clown? It's a shame I'm absolutely dog water at Dr. Mario, because this game is honestly super polished. There's a good amount of content here, and between the art style and gameplay options, so far, this is the definitive Dr. Mario experience. The bar wasn't that high. I hope to see this level of effort in the future for this series. I know it's been a whopping Fortnite, 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 since we talked about golf, but we have a pit stop on the Game Boy. Now, I bet you're looking at this box art, and all of you are thinking, where the fuck is Spike? Oh, thank God. Yet another golf game made by Camelot, we have Mobile Golf. This game sought to expand what they had done in Mario Golf for the Game Boy, but with their own spin and cast of new characters. However, the reasons we bring it up is through the use of a Japan exclusive add-on, players could connect to their Game Boys through their cellular devices to download four additional characters into the game. Mario, Yoshi, Peach, and Foreman, Spike. 
for some reason. I really do love when Nintendo pulls the most random characters out of their backlog. With his resurgence in popularity from the Mario movie, I would love to see him come up in some new wave of DLC for like Mario Kart or something. Holy smokes, it's Luigi. Okie dokie. Well, gosh, Luigi, it's a pleasure to see you again. Well, I'm actually in the middle of a video right now. Is there anything you wanted to say to your fans? Hey, whoa, hey, Luigi, take it easy. You're gonna get me demonetized. Well, no, I can't monetize my videos yet, but if I wanted to, hey, get back here. I wasn't done reprimanding you yet. Sliding into the first portable entry in the series, we have Mario Kart Super Circuit. This is the third yes, game in the yes. series, which means all they had to do was take the first and second game and just kind of smack them together. While the game kind of plays and looks a little bit closer to Super Mario Kart, it also uses pixelated versions of the models from 64. While it kind of plays a little bit weird, that's mainly my fault. I'm currently playing this on a flat screen TV, which is leaps and bounds away from how it was ever initially meant to be played. This game carried itself hard for the novelty of it being the first portable Mario Kart, one you could play anywhere. So the fact it looks and feels like this, and hell, the fact we have it at all is pretty impressive. While I personally don't feel attached to any of the courses in the game, given I didn't play it until making this video and I have a hard time getting accustomed to flat courses like this, they were still putting a boatload of effort into these courses. Not only is there a really creative variety of course themes at display here, ones that rival even those of 64 and maybe even Wii, each one had card art of the characters on the course, which is an excellent amount of detail, giving this game a lot more identity than I think some of the other games. On top of this, you could unlock all the courses from Super Mario Kart, which brings the course total up to 40. Do you understand, like, how big of a deal that is? Up to this point, the most we had was around 20 a game. Now, if I liked any of Super's courses, this would be awesome, but it's only kind of cool. However, in my opinion, it only really had one minor shortcoming, and that's in the form of its roster. Given how they scanned in the models from 64, that means we still have no new racers and we are working with the same deadbeats as usual. I understand why they wouldn't want to add in new racers, but I feel like especially considering Mario Party 3 came out last year with the introduction of Waluigi and Daisy, they could have added them in. Or hell, maybe even Kamek. That model was fully functional in a previous build of the game. I just feel like if they added one new racer or something, it would have made this game have a little bit more identity. Kind of how DK Jr. gives Super its identity. But... It's whatever, honestly. However, the fact that this is the only game with a random select block, despite the fact that this is the hardest game to play multiplayer with, even though that's probably the most you're gonna use a random select, but the game is really solid. Between the level themes and cavalcade of new courses, this shows a bright future for the Mario Kart games. And, uh, oh, uh, sorry guys, hold on, uh, my phone's ringing. Uh -huh. oh, okay, I'll tell him. Guys, I just got off the phone with Nintendo from 2001. Stay calm. But we just got offered to make a spiritual successor to any of the games we've talked about so far. I'm going to unmute my mic, guys, and everyone in unison tell them, pick Cross NP, okay? All right, cool. All right, tell them, guys. Here we go. I am a teacher. teacher. Super, Super Mario, Mario sweater. Son of a... For some reason, Nintendo thought their sweater printing business was really going to take off in the 21st century. So here we are, exactly where we were an hour ago, with sweater gaming. It's nothing super special, especially not super enough to have it in the name. It's just another one of those sweater design games that links up to a JN200 sewing machine. Though in all honesty, while the pictures are a lot more varied and interesting, I still can't help but feel like this is even less impressive than the first version due to the fact they've had about like 10 to 20 years now to improve on this. But hey, I don't know, I'm not a seamstress. Somehow, Wario made it in this game before Bowser did. Again, Wario stays winning. I don't know what's up with him in these early years. Probably the most interesting thing about this game is that it was shown off at Space World 2001, alongside a game called Kirby Family. That would have been basically the exact same thing, but with Kirby sprites, but never got released for some reason. Though a build of it was found on the Game Boy Color Lot check of 2020. Wait a minute. Did I, 500 subscriber Joe Frederick, just talk about a piece of Kirby-related media before Ant-Dude? You know what? That's going on the fridge right there. 
Now that my ego has been very thoroughly boosted, let's go ahead and talk about... Uh, hi, uh, Future Joe here again. Like I said, we're not actually going to be doing these bits anymore. Um, but we did get up to Melee. We recorded and edited this whole section, and Adam's gonna kill me because we're not even using it. Uh, yeah, so, uh, let's move on. I'll take it, I guess. Figures that the year that this disgrace was brought into the world is when we only have one game to talk about. At least one in this video. Mario Party 4 is what is going to begin a trend, not only just for the Party series, but all of the previous Mario Party spinoffs we've talked about thus far. Uh, mostly. <laughs> All the spin-off games on the N64 were great titles, and still hold up in their own regard, but it's truly in the GameCube generation where the Mario spin-offs start to feel that Mario charm, with all its wacky ideas and innovative game modes that we've come to expect from the titles, at some point in time. And no more so is that true than with Mario Party 4. The game comes swinging out the gate with some beautiful graphics for the time. This is the first and only instance in Mario Party history that a game has pre-rendered cutscenes. You could really tell that Hudson and Nintendo wanted to show off the power of this console, bragging to all their fans that this was a new generation of gaming and parties as they knew it. It's a shame that the animation's still look kinda janky. So the plot of Mario Party 4, which is as pointless as saying the lore of Teletubbies, is that the whole gang was invited to Peach's castle for a party hosted by the League of Losers over here. And that's it! Like Mario Party 3, there is a story mode, but it's not nearly as intricate. You get told it's your birthday and everyone got you gifts, but instead of handing them to you, they have you play through each board in the game to earn your gifts. After you beat the computers on a given board, you'll be rewarded with one of your presents. Your gifts then get shot over to the collection room, where every character has a little display of their house where all their gifts get to decorate the room. These are pretty neat and all, and it does give your players something to work towards if they just want to play Mario Party solo, but this is a bit much. I mean, we're talking six boards, 15 turns each, for eight characters. And with it taking about an hour each time I had to play through one of these boards, you're looking at 48 hours to 100% a Mario Party game. Sure, the game's prior had even more of this kind of stuff with collectibles and things to unlock that might require some grinding, but the majority of the trinkets can be unlocked just by playing through the other game modes and getting some kind of currency. I kinda wish they just scrapped the story mode in this case, and just rewarded these gifts for anyone who wins a given board with that character. So if you played as Mario during multiplayer mode on- Oh god, what are the boards from this game? Um... On Shy Guy's Safari, you just get rewarded with Mario's present that he would have gotten in the story mode. It's neat it's here, but we've seen where we're going with these kind of single player modes, and I just think it's handled a lot better in the future. That's not to say this game doesn't offer any other neat modes though. There's the extras room, which has this garage band looking place with Thwomp and Whomp. There isn't anything too crazy with Womp, just a few alternate board game modes based around the Mushroom's power-ups in the games. But the Thwomp list is really interesting. He has a bunch of unique one-player minigames focused on racking up the highest score. This honestly is super cool, and adding this gives it this almost arcade collection to the game. I could totally see people competing over this, passing the controller back and forth trying to one-up their friends. You even get these little titles based on how well you do. The only thing this is missing is some kind of like high scoreboard where you could put your name. Sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm getting off track. As far as the core of the game goes, it's just Mario Party. It's what you've come to expect by the fourth installment of the series. Sure, there are some changes like course themes and visuals, characters can carry up to three items, and it has some of the best minigames the franchise have ever seen, dungeon duos, book squirm, etc. But at the end of the day, this just kind of feels like an N64 Mario Party game with a new cone of paint and a few bells and whistles added to it. It's good. It feels a little slow in some places, but there's not too much to talk about. I mean, uh... I guess it's kind of weird to see Daisy's modern model and still using her N64 voice direction. All right, let's move on. That was 2002. Everyone enjoy that? All right, buckle up for 2003! All right, we got a lot of big titles to cover this year, so we're just going to blitz through a few fast ones. Super Mario Fushigo no Ja Jan Lan translates to the words on screen was another Japan exclusive machine, but not one you probably aren't familiar with. It's one of those machines where you put in a quarter or token and try to launch it into the machine to push down a bunch of other tokens so you get a higher score. 
It's one of those games. What do you want me to say? Mario Party E? It was a combination of a real life card game using the GBA e-reader to play a game of Mario Party in your own home. I wish there was a way to play Mario Party already in your own home. While I think the concept is incredibly cool, it's just pretty novel and based off a gimmick, and it just requires way too much setup. Like you have friends over and you wanna play a board game, what's going to be more appealing? Getting all this or just playing Mario Party? Maybe I'll get to play it one day, or maybe I'll decide to make good financial decisions. We'll never know. Nintendo Puzzle Collection was a trilogy of some of Nintendo's most famous puzzle games out at the time. Panel Day Pawn, the game that weird flower from Smash Bros came from, you know, the one where it hits you when you take DOT, I, I fucking hate that item. Yoshi's Cookie, and of course, Dr. Mario. Not too much here to say, just thought it was worth mentioning since this is technically a Dr. Mario game, but it also was never released here in the States. We technically would get a port of this to the Game Boy Advance in 2005, but it did end up dropping Yoshi's Cookie for some reason. You'd think it would be Panel Day Pond, considering that was more aimed at a Japanese audience, but whatever, I don't know. Now before we get into the major releases of 2003, while we're doing this rapid fire round, might as well knock out some of these smaller titles from 2004. So I'm gonna throw it to Future Joe to handle. Thanks, Past Joe. Wait, what the fuck happens to your are uh, my eye? Don't worry about it. N no, dude, wait, you gotta tell me. Anyways, 2004 saw the release of Mario vs. Donkey Kong. And while this series is equal parts Mario as it is Donkey Kong, I'm still gonna push those into the Mario's Friends video that I'll make if this video does well. Then there was Super Mario Fushigo no Koro Koro Party. It was an arcade recreation of Mario Party 5, exclusive to Japan. It combined assets from Mario Party 5 and this huge unit to play a variety of different minigames on it. This is the coolest arcade machine we've covered so far, and I wish we get to see more things like this nowadays. And that'll wrap up my time. Throwing it back to you, President Joe. Would you look at that? I'm fine. Tell you what, since I already bought this eye patch in preparation, I might as well put it on and fuck with past Joe. I'm gonna throw it to future Joe to handle. Thanks, past Joe. Mario Golf Toadstool Tour, plain and simple, is an improvement over 64 in every single way. Not only does it retain the initial charm the first one captured, with an even funnier opening cutscene, but it also has a boatload of new courses with some unique environments, and a good amount of characters. And they're ones we actually care about! Everyone from the first game is back! Well, excluding Baby Mario. But now there's a total of nine new characters. Daisy, Waluigi, Birdo, Koopa Troopa, Diddy Kong, Bowser Jr., Boo, Shadow Mario, and Petey Piranha are all here. Okay, this is a total side tangent, but am I the only one that thinks Shadow Mario is an infinitely cooler clone character that we could be doing instead of Metal Mario? I don't know, maybe it's just his voice and the like translucent particle effect they've got going on. Are we gonna talk about golf at any point in this section already? While I was able to work with the N64 controls, Toadstool Tour and its updated graphical capabilities streamlined the golfing experience tenfold. At least for me. Doesn't mean I'm any better at this game though. And while the game still has speed and ring golf like the first one, they added so many more fun party modes. Coin golf, gambling, so much more. This is the definitive Mario Golf experience up to this point in time. Meanwhile... THERE'S TWO OF THEM! Finally. I'm home. Despite the fact I was only still a single year old when this game came out, Mario Kart Double Dash might be the first video game I ever remember playing. I remember playing this game for countless hours with my sisters growing up, which means for those of you playing along at home, we're officially getting into the era of Mario games that made up my childhood, which means... Mario Kart Double Dash improved on 64 in almost every way. For starters, every core element of Mario Kart has been improved in spades. The music is great, the courses are oozing with charm, and the controls are just as bouncy, if not more fun, than they ever have been up to this point. Not only that, but Mambo and the gang look great. That probably goes without saying at this point. As I previously mentioned, the jump in horsepower was made very evident with Mario Party 4, but it's worth reiterating due to the fact that this game was announced in a really weird way. Nintendo knew if this newfangled block had any chance of selling to the masses, they needed to wow over consumers with a glimpse of the future. They needed to show everyone a Mario Kart worth investing in. So they showed everyone melee models put in N64 go-karts driving down slowly. 
<laughs> Do you think they saw a return in investment? Of course, at the time, I think fans were just excited to know that a Mario Kart was in development. But by today's standards, come on, this is night and day. We're getting to you, just give me a little bit of time, please. Now, to be fair, Mario Kart Double Dash did come with some faults, most prevalently being the courses. While great, we're limited. Super Circuit came out on the Game Boy Advance two years ago with twice the amount of courses. On one of these of all things! Sure, the difference in quality of these stages is significant, but fans were just expecting more out of this new generation of Mario Kart. But it's safe to say while some were bothered by this, most were won over by all the new positives that were in this game. The roster size was tripled! As stated prior, the gimmick of the game is that there are now two racers per kart, with each racer coming with a buddy, and each buddy system coming with a special item. Not only does this mean there are now inherent advantages and disadvantages to who you're picking, but there's now an extra level of strategy based on the combination of racers you're picking. Sure, this means some staple items are now locked behind characters like the triple shells and golden mushroom, but who gives a fuck about that when all I gotta do is pick Bowser Jr. and now I'm <laughs> The monkeys got bananas, the bros are spitting fire, and the girls are emotionally manipulating you to harvest you and weaponize all of your assets against you like they all- And while these are of course the most talked about additions in this game, there are some pretty monumental ones that often get forgotten about, such as multiple cards and the quality of the unlockables. In all the racing games we mentioned previously, the only thing that there really was to do for a single player experience was pick a racer, beat all the cups, maybe snag a mirror mode, and get on your way. But now, in Mario Kart Double Dash, there are actual things to do! The most common unlockable are different kart combinations. Cards can be selected alongside your characters now, and while the weight class of your characters are still pretty determined by the combination of characters you're picking, you can select a different kart to help gauge your speed and handling of the racers. Not only does every racer have a custom card assigned to them, but as one final reward, you can unlock the parade car you've been driven around in after winning a Grand Prix. That's pretty freaking cool. On top of the cards, you can also unlock more battle mode stages, as well as four additional characters. While Toad being an unlockable character is the equivalent of getting an empty birthday card, it's notable for the fact that this was Toadette's first appearance in the Mario franchise as a whole. She wasn't anywhere in the Mario canon before this game, but Toad needed a partner, and Baby Mario was taken this time. You know who had been in the Mario franchise, though? King Boo and Petey Piranha. I always loved their inclusion in this game. They were two major antagonists for the two Mario games on the console at this point, and they're just plain fun to have. They do, however, have no special item tied to them, though. Instead, they get all of them. Some say that's broken, others say it's really broken. There's just so much good to talk about here. The battle mode, the land play, freaking Rainbow Road. How have I not talked about Rainbow Road yet? Raining it in as best as I can though, let's talk about the roster. In my original video about Double Dash, I basically said that the roster was perfect as is. I suggested that maybe we could change the babies for Dr. E. Gad and a Poltergeist, just because I thought they could have some really cool cards brought into the game. And I had a really cool idea for what their special item could be. But this was honestly just a nitpick. The roster here is great as is. Sure, I think it's a little weird that there's baby characters, but there's only really two of them. They can't do that much damage, right? I kind of have been dancing back and forth on when I want to say the golden age of Mario spinoffs take place, but I can now safely say with the release of Double Dash, we're there, fellas. Double Dash pushes forward the brand of Mario spinoffs in a completely new and better direction. We're now focusing more on pushing unique spins on gameplay, not going for as much traditional traditional sports or racing experiences, but now pushing wacky ideas and character-specific items and carts. No longer are these games just racing games with Mario in them, like some of the previous titles could be argued to have been, these are now going to be Mario games. I don't say this in any form of slight to Mario 64, I think that game is great, but what has more personality behind it? This or all this? I of course harbor some nostalgia for Double Dash, but I'm glad I do, because it's an excellent video game that deserves its praises. And I'm not just saying it because I played it a lot as a kid, though I'm, I'm sure it affects it a, a little bit. And I'm not gonna be surprised if it ends up landing near the top 10 of the final ranking. And next up, we have Mario Party 5. And I'm gonna drop the act here, guys. This is me from eight months in the future. We forgot to do this section. I don't remember initially why we skipped over it, but we just kind of put it on the back burner and then completely forgot about it when we started drowning in the sports game titles in future years. Honestly though, there's really not too much to say about it other than it is easily the worst Mario Party game up to this point and maybe one of the worst ones in the main series. 
It's basically just Mario Party 4, but way slower. The single player mode is a freaking drag and it's repetitive and it's just not fun. The themes are pretty uninspired with some of the least memorable boards up to this point in history. And the main thing that it really introduced was the orb system, which you're gonna hear me start praising when we get to Mario Party 6. But it was honestly just done really bad here. Orbs are essentially these little items you can throw down on tiles that are traps that could mess with other players, either by landing on them or passing over them, etc. They're an excellent addition to the Mario Party formula and adds a lot of strategy on the game, which honestly hasn't really been captured in some of the more future titles. But it was just done not very well here. It takes forever to get the orbs from the little machines, and when you throw them down, it doesn't give you like a little symbol to show it's your orb, it's just a vague symbol. Like, Adam, throw up a comparison right now. Now between how long it takes to get an orb in Mario Party 6 and how long it takes to get an orb from one of the machines in Mario Party 5. It's just, it's just not fun. Like, yeah, it'll work if it's the only Mario Party game you have and maybe you've played through all the other Mario Party games and are looking to just spice up the evening, but it's just, it's just not fun. It's my least favorite. I'm sorry. I, this must be tonal whiplash from everything you've watched up to this point. But anyways, um, let's throw it back over to scripted Happy Joe. As we move into the year 2004, you're going to see that this year is kind of the meat of a sandwich. And what I mean by that is 2003 was kind of a big year. There were some smaller titles for sure, but there was a good amount of them. While 2004 only has, well, four games to talk about. And as we're soon going to see, 2005 is the year of the Mario Party spinoff brigade. So let's just skip the bread and get straight to the meat. Mario Golf Advance Tour is the first game we're gonna be talking about this year. And unfortunately, there's not really anything to talk about here. <laughs> Take the stellar RPG golf goodness from the first golf portable title, clean up the graphics a little bit, and you can tell what's grass now. I'm really trying here. I'm sorry if I don't spend too much time on the GBA games, but it's honestly just because there's not really much for me to talk about. The portable releases serve two functions. A, be a substantial port of their console counterparts, and B, have a satisfying RPG single player mode. And given just how many games we're tackling here today, I don't have the time to deep dive into all of these games and point out the differences in each version. And you know what? I'll give it a try. And I'm only just now noticing that literally in all of the Mario Golf games, there's this dude with sunglasses named Joe and I never noticed him up to this point. I'm sorry, sweet prince. You never know what you have till it's gone. I suppose I'll get my chance another day. It seems history is repeating itself, as Mario Power Tennis follows a very similar trend that Toadstool Tour set out, and knocks its N64 counterpart out of the park right away. While some people would try to tell you it's just more tennis, to them, I would say, I know I gave Mario Kart Double Dash the credit of being the turning point for the franchise, but Power Tennis is where we start to see a much clearer picture of what we can come to expect from specific Specifically the sports games. Tight visuals and catchy music are always to be expected, but where it starts to matter is how we talk about that patented Mambo Flare. While we never left it, this game really reinforces that we're in the golden era. I've mentioned what the golden era is briefly, but I feel like now is as good a time as any that we go over it in more detail so we can better outline the next few games we're going to be talking about. A game in this time period primarily falls in line with three requirements. First of which is a mechanic that Double Dash made a precedence for, but Power Tennis really outlined and standardized. Some form of signature move or character unique ability. Every character in this game has a super move for more powerful shots. And these aren't just some really powerful swing and that's it. A lot of these have their own unique modifiers. Sure, while Donkey Kong and Bowser have more traditional heavy swings that'll knock the player back, some of them are really creative. Like Bowser Jr's, who uses his paintbrush to shoot out three balls with two being duds. They are also a really clever way to build up a character's personality. And like Double Dash, gives you more incentive on who you're picking before a game, aside from some minor stat differences. Next up is an element that we've been building up since the N64, but has finally been fully realized. The bonus modes. While Tennis and Golf 64 had various ring modes and health, Tennis even had this weird, bizarre power-up mode, in the years prior, these somewhat felt more like afterthoughts in some cases. Distractions, but somewhat needless filler. Going forward, these minigames are going to be dialed up to 11. Are they all going to be winners? God, no. But they're going to be trying, and they're going to be silly. But most importantly, they're going to be creative. We see this in spades in Power Tennis, with this boatload of new minigames, such as Artist on the Court, 
Tic Tac Glow, and Coin Collectors, just to name a few. And then finally, and maybe the most important, is the stage design. This means stadiums, courts, fields, wherever the sport is being played, it's gotta have some goofy alternatives. In the N64 era, we had fairly standard designs, where you'd be lucky enough if the devs decided to swap a Wario PNG onto the field. But in the golden era of Mario sports games, they finally decided to take some fucking inspiration from literally all of this and give us stages with actual unique gimmicks and ways to spice up the gameplay loop that other games of the genre just wouldn't provide. The inclusion of wacky stages actually gives the normal stages an inherent value that they didn't have before. It turns them almost into this final destination supplement. You and your cousin might be duking it out having a good time on Luigi's Mansion, but with enough shit talk and chuckles from the wrong side of the couch, you can get serious fast, demanding a more intense game. And yes, I'm speaking from experience, Kay, you know exactly who you are. While all the games in the golden era aren't always going to fit into these three categories perfectly, Hell, some of them might not even get into one. And by looking at the franchise under these three parameters, it really starts to outline this era and the subsequent eras of the Mario spinoffs as a whole. At least for me and Adam, who have done nothing but eat, sleep, and breathe Mario games for three months now. Lucky for us, Power Tennis checks all three of these boxes and then some. The music is great, there are a boatload of fun characters and side content, and the core mechanics of the game are tighter than they ever have been. While I'm not the craziest fan of tennis games, it kinda just chalks up to run to the ball and swing. Power Tennis is the most engaged I've been with a tennis video game to date, so I'm gonna have to give it some good points for that. Oh, and uh, just a little bullet point at the end here, they have really fun animated cutscenes in this game, and you can unlock a blooper reel where they went out of their way to animate additional scenes and takes of these cutscenes. It, it's just really funny, like come on, you can't tell me this isn't great. Now let's get into one of the main reasons I decided to make this video in the first place, because I've got an axe to grind and a point to prove. Mario Party 6 is the best Mario Party game to date. Shut up, it's an objective fact. You're asking if this is the one I grew up with? That doesn't matter. Yeah, okay, so Mario Party 6 is the best game in the franchise, and I'm just gonna jump straight into the story of this because we got a lot of ground to cover here. Mario and friends are hanging out in this pop-up book when they see that the moon and sun are fighting over who is the best. Kind of like the first Mario Party game, the second Mario Party game, the third Mario Party game, the fourth Mario Party. So Mario being the absolute messiah that he is, tells everybody, and off they go, because everyone knows Mario Party just decides all problems. All world events, all wars could be solved by these funky little dice. I mean, look how well it's worked for Mario and the gang. They never fight anymore because they've played Mario Party so much. I'm sure they're never gonna get in arguments like this again on the DS in a few more years. So the inclusion of the sun and the moon tie into the major mechanic Nintendo pushed with Mario Party 6, which is the introduction of a day and night cycle. This might actually sound a little bit familiar to veterans at this point because there was actually a map back in, oh God, um, um, one of the Mario Party games. <laughs> one, of, one of the first three. Uh, put it up on screen, Adam. They decided to revisit it and make it the core mechanic for this game. Every three turns, the stage will turn from day to night. Not only will this affect various elements on the board, but it will also change how certain minigames play and look. Take the minigame What Goes Up, for example. If played during the day, it's a platforming race where you're trying to get the highest score. But if played at night, now it's a race to see who can avoid the platforms and drop to the ground before the others. While not all minigames have drastic changes like these, the wide majority of the other minigames have different aesthetics and color palettes based on the time of day, which is just an unnecessary level of quality that I adore to see. The time of day also affects each of the boards in a unique and chaos ensuing way. Some stages have boo houses that players can use to steal coins or stars from enemies, but only at night. Meanwhile, there are grander changes, like in Twilight Town, where you can buy multiple stars at a time in the center of the map. But the major twist is that at night, the prices of stars are randomized to either be ridiculously high or super cheap. So do you secure a star at night when you have the chance but spend more of your coins? Or do you risk it and run around the board again, hoping to get there when the prices are down but risk not getting the stars because you could lose your coins from the game just being Mario Party? While some maps are definitely simpler than others, every board in the game has mechanics like these to keep players on their toes. Then, as an extra layer of things to consider, the orbs return from five and are just way better. For starters, you no longer have to go through a slow and tedious dialogue box and animation every time you want to get one. Instead, now you just have to run past them, it gets added to your inventory, and you keep on moving. 
in addition to that, the orb spaces are a lot easier to understand now. Instead of having just some vague symbol on the ground, there are now character portraits that are properly colored to distinguish them on the board. And it's a lot easier to tell what trap activates when you step on it and when you pass it. The single player offerings are also pretty solid too. Sure, there isn't a full story mode, but you have these little mini game gauntlets that you can use to earn stars at the star bank, which is where you can get a bunch of unlockables for the game, such as character taunts, mini game modes, even some bigger rewards like a new character and stage. However, my childhood favorite from this are the pop-up scrapbook pages that shows all the characters playing little mini games. Also, something that's really nice is you can get these stars from playing any game mode in the game. It can be from party mode, minigame mode, or the single player mode, which completely fixes the problems I had with Mario Party 4. Obviously, the single player mode is still going to be the fastest, but it isn't the only option. Oh, and dude, the additional minigame modes are really good. Battle bingo, are you kidding? Any game that has a battle bingo mode has to be S tier. Oh, and the mic mode? Honestly, I could really make a full video explaining why Mario Party 6 is just so damn good, but this really isn't the place for it. And while I obviously have my nostalgia goggles on for this one, I also just think this from a design standpoint is way better than any of the other GameCube offerings so far, which is why it breaks my heart that it's like the lowest ranked and selling game in the franchise. It definitely comes from a fact these games were coming out as yearly releases, but luckily a lot of online reviewers like Scott the Waz and Ant Dude have previously mentioned this is one of their favorites too, so thank God. But for now, this game is going to be the peak of the Mario Party franchise, in my opinion so far. But that doesn't mean we're going directly downhill from here. The next few Mario Party games I actually am very fond of just the same, so stick around. D don't click off now that I've said... <laughs> Don't click off, please. I still have so much more to talk about. All right, it's time for 2005. I heard there were a lot of games this year, so let's see how many we're dealing with. Wait, seriously? How many would it have been if we were including mainline games in here? Yahoo! Well, this list is absolutely stacked, and we have some big titles here. These aren't all just duds. But I guess it would make sense if we got through some of those lesser titles before we jumped into the bigger ones. So you know what? Let's just get into some of the most bizarre inclusions in this video so far. It was around this time that Nintendo was starting to get some backlash from their investors. The third party support on the GameCube up to this point was pretty lackluster at best. It was almost entirely made up of kids licensed games or geist. So Nintendo started this initiative of not only inviting other developers to bring their games to their consoles, but also let them put exclusive Nintendo characters in their games. This was most notably seen with Nintendo letting Link be in Soul Calibur. And this was least notably known when Nintendo gave out the basic Mario models to NBA Street and SSX on tour. These collaborations are a joke! They thought that they could just include Mario, Luigi, and Peach, and somehow the sales numbers would just shoot up with Ocarina of Time or something! I swear the developers only took this deal just so it would give them a selling point on the box. Because they did nothing with this opportunity! They literally just put the models over the pre-rigged animations of the other basketball players. Like, come on, look at this! This just feels like their mascot suits, not the actual characters! I feel so bad for the kids who asked for a Mario game, and on Christmas they woke up with one of these! When they could have gotten any one of these! I mean, just the thought of getting a game with Mario on the box as a selling point to make you think you're getting into some classic Mario hijinks, only to be sold a product that's completely different than what you were led to believe? Do you think they talk at the family reunion? Mario Party Advance. It was the first attempt at a portable Mario Party for the Game Boy Advanced. Here's the thing! When Nintendo took this portable approach with Mario Kart Super Circuit two years earlier, they knew that at its core, even though it's meant to be played in a group environment, racing is still a fun gameplay mechanic that almost anyone can enjoy. Party Advanced here is the equivalent of your kid playing Russian Roulette alone during the long car drive. Nintendo had to have known a conversion of the traditional Mario Party experience just wasn't going to be feasible for a portability factor, at least on the current hardware. So they adapted the Mario Party formula into a single player experience. How, do you, how did they do that? Whoa, 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 I thought I still had a few more years till I had to talk about the car. Mario Party Advanced is not a Mario Party game. It's a fetch quest simulator with a bunch of mini games tacked on. The whole game is just a giant semi-open world resource management game where you drive around, talk to Mario characters, play a mini game, sometimes get a side quest that requires you to go somewhere else on the map, sometimes be locked out behind a character specific mission where you have to game over and swap characters, all the way to the character specific mission as said character, play a mini game, sometimes get a 
side quest of Bryce and Joseph Wilson. It is a grueling experience, but I can't say it's one I can't at least somewhat respect. The developers knew they couldn't make a Mario Party to the full extent, so rather than try to push out a really, really bad attempt, they just put out an interesting attempt. The game has its merits. I like the sprite art and some of the writing can be a bit funny at times. Oh, and the mini games, I'm reaching. It's also a matter of like, how is this game going to fulfill its purpose? I know the idea here is that kids could try to link up through link cables and have a Mario Party action adventure anywhere they want. But not only is it going to require a lot of janky setup to get these courts connected between more than two people, especially if you're trying to do this in a car, but even when you're doing this at home on the floor where everyone can plug in and stretch out, this is a lot of work for a subpar Mario Party. I don't mean to bag on the portable adaptations of these console games. I'm sure this and Super Circuit were both magical experiences when they first came out. And I know I'm heavily spoiled with some of the portable gaming experience I get to have now, let alone growing up with the DS line of software. So I know it might seem like I'm being a little unfair to these games, but you're over an hour into this video, so clearly you've looked past my faults, and I can appreciate that from my viewers. All right, I'm gonna be honest with you guys here. I had no idea what this game was doing on the list when I was researching this video. Yakumon DS is a Mahjong simulator played entirely with Mario characters, and I've never heard of this before. Like, ever, not in any YouTube videos, not through talking to people online, which, to be honest, I don't know what this says about my personal life that we're this far into the Mario franchise, and this is the first time I'm stuck. I mean, hell, even the sweater games were on my radar before this. It really couldn't be helped, though. This game was not only only ever released in Japan, and it's only been referenced in Toadsworth's trophy description in Brawl of all places. Unfortunately, I'm not a Mahjong player. I only recently have been trying to understand Shogi, but I bet people who liked this game really adored it. There's a lot of content, unlockable characters, and you could even play online. If you were a Mahjong head that just so happened to like Mario with a reliable internet in the year 2005 with the DS, maybe there was something here for you. All right, so far 2005 has given us two really weird cameo inclusions, a Mahjong simulator, a Mario party in sheep's clothing. So what's next? Oh man. Now, if you'd prefer to get down and boogie, we have Dance Dance Revolution Mario Mix. This game is freaking bizarre, dude. Another attempt to have some third-party representation on the system. But this time, instead of just putting a Mario model in a different game, Nintendo opted to make their entirely own unique thing, as opposed to just porting over DDR with a few Mario tracks in it. Now, I'm not gonna say this game was entirely created from the ground up, as it reuses a lot of assets from the Mario Party games. I'm talking animations, music, sound effects, models, the whole shebang. But it's not to say that this game didn't have its own little flares put in every now and then. I'll give the game some credit, it's looking a lot better than the previous attempts. Now, admittedly, I didn't actively play through this one. Why would I not play this game? Well, uh, you see... But honestly, from what I can tell, DDR Mario Mix, while janky as hell and really weird to look at, is a fun installment in the franchise. Not only do I think it's cool that Nintendo chose to make their own DDR game as opposed to just slapping Mario on one, and while of course, while this game looks like Frankenstein's creation doing the Monster Mash, they went out of their way to make an entire story mode to play through here, while Waluigi of all people is the main antagonist. I mean, hey, out of all the games where they can make him a villain, the one with Twinkle Twinkle Little Star just feels like a no-brainer. There also is a plethora of mini games to distract yourself with here. I can't speak for the quality of them, but I can at least respect that they tried. And come on, you're going to look at this footage and not get enjoyment just out of the insanity alone? This game is just a product of a time where Nintendo was willing to do more experimental things with the Mario IP. I haven't really been singing this year's praises, as I've mostly been picking fun at how weird it's been, but 2005 has just been so interesting, and DDR is no exception, and it isn't going to let up either, as we have two arcade titles to talk about next. Interestingly enough, we have a Mario Kart arcade machine, and to be honest, I'm surprised it took them this long to tackle the concept. It astounds me that we had a Mario Party arcade machine before the literal racing game, and who else but Nintendo to make an arcade racing game that's just so damn creative? Namco. The answer is Namco. Yes, so this game was developed and published by Namco, making it the first non-Nintendo developed Mario Kart game. I was wondering what these tumors were doing here. Despite the shift in developers, however, this game is as Mario Kart as an arcade Mario Kart could get. For starters, not only is the game running off of the same engine as 
but it also gives each character a boatload of unlockable unique items to use. This is a huge change from Double Dash, and we haven't seen anything like this since then. Instead of one character unique item, each character is packing six apiece. Now you might have noticed I used the term unlock, how do you unlock content on an arcade machine? Well, that brings us to quite possibly the most interesting thing about an arcade machine I've ever seen, the aptly named Mario Karts. These little guys can be used at any Mario Kart GP machine to track your progress and save it. What a cool concept. I'm not sure how these cards were distributed in the first place, but I found some sketchy looking sites offering to sell them to me for a dollar. And I'm okay. I don't want to dox myself for content. Uh, yeah, okay. Also, what the fuck? As for the game itself, Mario Kart. It's rigid, it's a little clunky, but it's Mario Kart. Plays well and it would be fun with friends. I haven't had the chance to play the original, but I've played a few of the sequels with some friends and I had a decently good time. Not much else to say, honestly. All right, the name on the screen, Party 2, is the sequel to the first Koro Koro machine we talked about back in 2003. Honestly, there isn't much to say. Given how barren its Wikipedia entry is and how I can find little to no footage of this thing online, I'm just going to chalk this one up to another take in an arcade Mario Party machine. I'm sure it was cool back in the day for those who got to experience it, but for me, eh. Now you think with the fact that we've covered seven games this year so far, we'd almost be done and ready to move into 2006, right? Wrong! Because 2005 was the year of Mario sports games. Starting us off, we have the first visit to the sport of baseball. Looking into this game for this video was kind of a trip because I have infinitely more experience with Mario's Super Suggers for the Wii. So this is kind of like looking into a different timeline for me. Luckily for me though, a lot of what I love about Swaggers seems to be present here. First try, yeah? Uh, dude, kinda in the middle of a review here. Yeah, about that, Joe, buddy. Uh, hmm. <clears throat> Considering you made me play this game for the video and you know jack shit oh. to do with what you're talking about, I'm not overly convinced you're qualified for this section. <laughs> Adam, buddy, you're kind of going off script here. Uh, just, just let me continue with the review and... And that's for Mario Paint Studio. Well, to start us off, it's nice Nintendo found other sports outside of golf and tennis. Nope, that does not count at all. It's evident the four sportsmen of the war apocalypse were hitting all the marks with consumers, because this is where the sports games really start to get some momentum in the Mario franchise. As a result, we have Superstar Baseball. Plot summary? <laughs> Uh, no thank you. I'll take my Mario and friends are great, Bowser wants to be a d as a plot any day of the week. I do like the effort that goes into these intros though, even if I'm not sure they understood the rules of baseball. What is Wario going for here? DK decided to throw the ball rather than bat it, which is a big <coughs> and Mario thinks he's that guy and doesn't even run because he's confident in his home run. Also a known terrorist is in the crowd. The game follows the standard Mario sports mixture. Lots of characters, fun modes, and that colourful Nintendo aesthetic we all come to know. These were the ingredients chosen to make the perfect Mario sports game. Since Joe loves to talk about rosters a lot, we'll start there. This game's got the spin-off classics, and even has some neat add-ins. There's a lot of things going on here with the quote-unquote playable characters, so we'll run through that one briefly. To start with, we have the team captains, mainline characters who act as previously said. Then we crack on with the team players, who are anything but that. These are just people who fill up space in the pitch, the babies are back, but we have standards like Toads, Coopers, Paracoopers, and... Goombas? How the fuck does a Goomba play baseball? The same way he rides a bike, dumbass. Okay then, I guess. That's fine. Since we don't care for standard and legal conventions, DK here gets to have his fist in a boxing glove instead of a bat, but when I have 50k in unpaid taxes, oh, then we're breaking the rules. We also have some Mario Sunshine representation with Shadow Ma- no, Wait, no, no, we don't. Uh, who was here from that game again? Oh, yeah. It's, uh... Random thing from Mario Delfino and a uh, random smaller thing from Mario Delfino. Man, I can't wait to get to Mario Strikers charge and have my left testicle on the field. And he says I'm unqualified to do this review. To bring us back to Joe's trilogy of golden staples, there's the character uniqueness. What I really liked was not only how each character has a star batting, which are all different abilities that give you a slight edge, unless you're Waluigi, this thing ruined me more than benefited, but also each character has their own unique bat, except for you know who. There's also rival moments where certain characters when pitching against certain batters we have a brief cinematic to show that not even sports can remedy a bad night of Mario Party. This game wasn't really the easiest thing to get into, I'll be honest. Like, I, I got pitching down, but with this game's AI, it's just a matter of time before they- yeah, 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 exactly that. Batting was a learning curve, though. I swear, going on your own perception gets you nowhere. 
because I was having a miserable time here. I just charged my swing, waited for the throw, and prayed. Not only did I hit it, but it fall to some arsehole's hands. I'm sure with practice mates perfect, but- Adam, I'm... what the fuck is wrong with you? You're not getting a single run. I'm trying, but Audrey 2 here said no. <clears throat> in Gold Age Era Part 2, we have our wacky stages. Mario Superstar Baseball does a good job of these, as aside from our standard fields, we also have some themed off Mario areas like Peach's Castle, DK Jungle, and fuck you Plant Zone. Each one has a unique gimmick. Plant Zones was make sure Adam has no fun at all. Adam, get your head in the game, please! It's the last turn around and you have zero runs! <sighs> Alright, it's only 5-0. and oh. I just gotta be a different animal and remain the same beast. The guys are all here and believe in me. Well, Daisy's here, she's the team captain, but we got this nevertheless. Oh, kiss my British ass. Did you do any better at the mini games, at least? I mean, they were there to finish your little trilogy and they were baseball centered, so uh, ticks the box. Much like how this game made me tick. But to put my own insecurity, I mean lack of experience aside, this game does what it says on the tin. It's a perfectly competent Mario baseball game, and given it's not the last, it did its job well enough. Well, it's certainly not my favourite, we'll get to that soon. I can't fault it too much. Are you happy now, Joe? You know it's weird knowing that you actually played a video game as opposed to some of the DOS tools I've been making you run this whole video. Does this mean I can play Strikers? Back in your corner now. Yeah, well I bet you didn't even have friends from- Mario Party 7 is the first installment in the franchise to not only have the letter 7 in it, but also one number higher than six. Am I alone in thinking that Mario Party 7 might be the least talked about in the franchise? Like, the N64 games kind of all get lumped into the same conversation. Mario Party 4 is the first GameCube installment. Mario Party 5 is the worst GameCube installment. Mario Party 6 seems to be the dark horse in the race. And Mario Party 7... Which is so bizarre to me because this game does so much right and no one seems to talk about it. Alright, so we're technically nine games into this franchise already, so let's get something out of the way up front. The game is Mario Party. Roll the dice, play a mini game, get the star, turn it in. The orbs from Mario Party 5 and 6 returned, but now with some minor changes. First of all, the spaces that they affect no longer take the shape of the character, now being replaced with an emblem. This is kind of a minor downgrade in my opinion, but it's not the end of the world. Something good this game actually does with the orbs is they take a page out of Double Dash and there are pairs of characters with their own unique special items. Mario and Luigi huck fireballs to steal coins, the princesses can make flowers under their feet to avoid obstacles and still get coins, the toads double their rolls for three turns, the list goes on. Some of these are pretty wicked strong and can turn a game if used correctly. Honestly, at this point in the video, you know my preferences. These are an amazing inclusion. It gives all the characters more of a purpose and adds an extra layer of strategy. And more importantly for Mario Party, bullshit. Because of this new orb system, that meant the game had to put their roster into pairs again, which means we gained dry bones for Boo and Birdo for Yoshi. However, this unfortunately means that not only the Koopa Kids are delegated back to Bowser spaces, but this will be their final appearance in, well, the franchise. We haven't spoken much about them in the video so far, but he was an icon of the Mario Party franchise ever since the first installment. And while I've mentioned already that Bowser Jr. is my favorite character from these games, Koopa Kid is close up there for me. I've made it evident that Mario Party 6 is my favorite game in the franchise due to my experiences playing it as a kid. And Koopa Kid was my go-to back in the day. It does make sense why they'd start to phase him out. With Bowser Jr. becoming a more prevalent character since Sunshine, it really only made sense. Rest in peace, my funny little freaks. We're gonna miss you. Wake me up! Wake me up inside! I can't wake up! Wake me up inside! Save me! As for the unique modes in this game, there are primarily two of interest. First of which is the Solo Cruise. This is Mario Party 7's answer to a story mode experience, but it's nothing too special. It harkens closest to Mario Party 4's, I'd say, but instead of a free-for-all, it's just a 1v1 matchup. You play through each of the boards with a unique objective to tackle, and that's pretty much it. Aside from these challenges though, there really is no story mode you're going through, like in 3, 4, or maybe even 5. You get like a letter and a boss fight at the end of the campaign, but that's about it. The entire thing can be beaten within an hour and a half. For someone like me, I actually like when campaigns are kind of short in these games, but it kind of just feels like this was put here out of necessity rather than love. Then finally, one of the most interesting yet forgotten gimmicks in the Mario Party franchise is that there was an eight player mode. Nintendo was bragging about this when Smash 4 came out and this was here the whole time on the GameCube? 
Having an 8-player Mario Party game just sounds abysmal! Reviewers at the time were already complaining about how long and slow the game felt, which will soon lead to the apocalypse, but in the meantime... How the hell did they do this? Did they utilize the land technology that Double Dash did? No, actually, and uh, here, get closer. You're going to love this. They made players split the controllers in half. Look, I know correlation does not equal causation, but you have to admit this is some weird fortune-telling shit going on here. The game has a few different eight-player modes with either custom or limited minigames. I will say the idea of getting eight people to sit down and play through these modes sounds like a blast. And now it's going on the bucket list. But man, this has to be chaos incarnate. If any one of you have ever had the liberty of playing this mode, please let me know in the comments. I want to know every detail about how that went down. It really is odd to me because I feel like Mario Party 7 had some of the craziest ideas and innovations of the Mario Party formula, yet no one talks about it. Like the internet loses their collective minds over custom items in Double Dash, but not Mario Party 7? But stepping back here, how do I feel about the package as a whole? It's great. I didn't grow up playing 7 like I did 6, but I've had a handful of times playing it since, and to me it's on par with 6. I'm obviously going to give 6 extra points for nostalgia, but 7 has custom orbs, some great stage designs, and a lot of solid minigames. And depending on the day, I might prefer it over 6 just from a pure design standpoint. So far, I'd say it's my second favorite in the series. Oh my god, that was the second Mario Party game this year. We have to be getting close to the end here. Of course 2005 has a Mario Kart release! Why wouldn't they? They almost went two minutes without shoving the plumber down our throats! Mario Kart DS is the first <coughs> good portable Mario Kart game. While Advanced has its fans, and I can really respect it now from a modern lens, I'd say it harkens much closer to Super Mario Kart, which you kind of already know my opinions on but DS is more faithful to literally every other game in the franchise up to this point. As for the game itself, it's... Who would have thunk it? The game controls feel a little bit closer to Double Dash than they do 64, but aside from how the game plays, this actually changes a lot from the previous titles. The game does remove the mechanic of two racers per cart and character unique items, which will absolutely be missed. But for being a portable console, the game adds arguably some of the most content in the franchise. Not only did they learn from their mistakes of the previous game and doubled the track list, they gave all the characters two custom carts each, as opposed to one. They also let you draw little emblems on your car using the DS touchscreen. Doing more fucking drawing. There's two new series characters such as Dry Bones and Rob of all people, local co-op through download play, but two modes that cannot be understated, mission mode and online play. Starting us off to this day, mission mode is the best single player experience in Mario Kart history. Mainly because it's the only single player experience in Mario Kart history. The game throws you a handful of challenges in these little worlds, such as collecting coins, driving through rings. They even have you do boss battles at the end of each of these gauntlets. All of the bosses are from Mario 64, which might sound a little bit weird considering it's a Mario Kart game, but Mario 64 DS had just come out around this time, so I imagine it was just a simple model conversion. Trying to complete these challenges to get the fastest times and get rewarded with the most amount of stars is seriously addicting, and I, like others, have no idea why they haven't brought this idea back nowadays. Getting a little bit ahead of myself, Mario Kart 8 has a boatload of unlockable kart pieces that you can unlock after getting a certain amount of coins. But I always thought that it would have been so much cooler if some of these were unlocked behind these challenges. I mean, Mario Kart DS has upwards of 30 of them. It would make for such a good gameplay loop of each mission giving you a new kart piece. I mean, hell, maybe you could have one that you get just for completing the mission and then a second one for getting three stars. I just think it would be a much cooler way to unlock content in future Mario Kart games than just race. I know they somewhat brought these missions back through online events in Mario Kart Wii, but come on man, this deserves more than that. Then the second mode that got introduced in this game was online play. The ability to play Mario Kart online against anyone was monumental for the time. Of course, I was three years old and didn't get the chance to take full advantage of this, but I've heard how magical the experience was at the time. Though it's not exactly the same, I do have such fond memories of sitting outside my apartment patio and playing download play balloon battle with my neighbors. I'd have to stretch my arms all over the bushes just to get a consistent signal. I remember kind of annoying him about it because he always wanted to race, but I only really liked playing balloon battle as a kid. Also, the memories are a little bit hazy, but I think we did this with Mario Party DS and obviously Picto Chat at the time, but I don't remember it all too well. 
Mario Kart DS is just one of those games that despite there being several updated installments in the franchise, the game still holds its own merits. I mean, it's got mission mode, the little emblem thing is kind of cool, some of the best tracks in the series like Hello? Waluigi Pinball, Bowser's Airship, Luigi's Mansion, TikTok Clock, and Delfino Square? Let me tell you, Mario Kart DS had some of the most inspired courses of the entire franchise. <coughs> Anyways, what I was trying to say back there was Mario Kart DS is a solid title that might be deemed inferior by today's standards, but I actually think there's a lot of good reasons to go back to it, and it stood the test of time. I'd actually say it was one of the highest quality games at its release, even more so than Double Dash and even Mario Kart Wii, but we got a few years till we get to talk about that. Alright, 2005! Just one more game. Are we at Strikers yet? Yes! We're at the goddamn soccer game! Hell yeah! Wait, did you say soccer? We're not. Uh, the sport originated in Britain during the 19th century and was dubbed then as folk football, which was played- Nope! Either you get on with it, or I hire some guy on Fiverr too! <clears throat> Mario Strikers was the next step in the sports game line, having already covered tennis, golf, and baseball, and talk about knocking it out of the park first try. To start with, it's clear Next Level Games was understanding the Mario brand more and more with each entry in their lineup, as this game is oozing with charm and personality. If it's not the little victories when your captain scores, it's the special moves making everyone look so cool. I'm jumping ahead here, so let's wind it back a bit. Mario Strikers has you picking your captain, your supports, and then facing another team in a standard game of football. It's a 4v4 with your captain and their free minions, all of which will take on your captain's team colours, making them stand out more, while also showing, even as a minion of Bowser, trans rights are human rights in the Mushroom Kingdom, and the goal, <laughs> get it, is to score more goals than your opponent within the time limit. That's just repetitive writing. Oh, that's just repetitive I bet you played this one with your sisters all the time then, did you? Bite me. But of course, this is a Mario Sports spin-off game, so it's never as simple as that. We're following the same rules as always with a varied cast where each captain feels unique with their own super strikes. If you can manage to charge up your shot and hit the QTE here, you'll get an awesome cinematic and a powerful shot on goal. These don't always guarantee a goal, however, and can be a bit difficult to pull off given how aggressive this game can be. I am not exaggerating when I say, holy shit, this game is chaotic. And the reason it's my favourite in the sports lineup. See, while there's conventional tackling, who wants to do that when you can just straight up assault the other team? Seeing you ram someone into the electric gate and just walking off with a ball with some the funniest shit I've ever seen. It's just not that funny when they do it back to you. <laughs> Getting back on track, this game fits the sports bill nicely, with a ton of stadiums to choose and items to really shake things up. See, if you're overly aggressive, then rather than a red card like you deserve, the victim may get an item which ranges from a minor inconvenience to a free goal. There's a useful training mode as well to teach you how to do certain techniques like the dodge waddle. Surely it's not called that. And the decade was a much better choice, weren't it? There's not a whole lot else to say, really. It's uh, it's football. Well, later we'll see its sequel, which will really grow on this concept, making it one of my favourite sports games. But for now, I think we're ready to wrap up 2005, right, Joe? All right, we're done. We're done with 2005. Adam put up as many celebratory visual effects that we have. I want the fam kids cheering. I want the wounds. I want uh, dancing anime girls. I don't care. We did it. We're done with 2005. Going forward from here out, there are still going to be a few years that have a handful of titles, but I want to say from 2008 onwards, it's going to drastically go down. The years of getting three to four and sometimes even apparently 11 games in a year is officially over. Well, kind of. I shouldn't say officially. We've got maybe one big year coming up from 2007, but onward from there, it's going to get a lot quicker real fast. And hey, as a little bit of a break for us, 2006 only has one game to talk about. So let's hit the court with Mario Hoops 3 on 3. The Mushroom Kingdom up to this point has been no stranger to playing sports. But surprisingly, it's taken them this long to attempt basketball. Well, that doesn't count. I'm talking about a basketball game made by Nintendo. Huh? Square Enix? Basketball? You've gotta be kidding me. So the first Mario basketball game is made by the guys who brought this character into the world, and I'm sorry, but when you put it to me like that, I'm convinced we're living in the most cursed timeline. I thought you couldn't afford to lose. To be completely transparent, we actually didn't play this one ourselves. The game is primarily played with the touch screen of all things, which is impressive in form, but not so practical in practice. You dribble by tapping on the screen, you draw little symbols to perform super shots, and so on. Because of this, it makes the game in incredibly difficult to emulate. And given how I don't have a legitimate means to capture DS itself, we're going to be borrowing some footage from this guy on screen. Uh, Adam, you're awesome. I'm nothing! <laughs>
the power of editing, huh? 21st century. And if you like these visuals, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and make sure to hit that funny button. As far as I can tell from a surface level, this game fits right in with the golden era. The game has a boatload of characters with unique specials, a bunch of really creative and wacky stages, but now with this added twist of Square Enix characters being included, such as, uh, Ninja, a Cactus, and... Uh, am I the only one that finds this a little bit weird? Don't get me wrong, I'm stoked to have any crossover characters at all. And I was obsessed with ninjas as a kid, so dude, this was right up my alley. But out of all Square Enix characters, let alone the Final Fantasy reps, you chose these guys? Like, we could have been ballin' with Cloud Strife or Sora Kingdom Heart. But nah, the nameless personalityless avatars and the funny plant will do just fine. Even a chocobo or something would have felt a bit more on brand. But I guess giving those things arms would be kind of dementing, wouldn't it? The game does have other things to work towards, such as unlockable courses, basketballs, and hey, even a few more character- Wait, Moogle is in this game?! I honestly can't speak too much for how fun the game is to play, but you can tell that Square was really giving it their all. And while this review might be a bit shorter than you think it would deserve, I kind of have more to say about this game when we get to Mario Sports Mix in a few more years, so just buckle up for now. If you want much more of a deep dive on this game and just kind of see how cool it is, I recommend watching this video from Jordan Fringe Gaming. He does a much better job explaining it than I have. Drifting into 2007, we have the second Mario Kart arcade game, GP2. The game is very similar to its predecessor, but there are some minor additions that we should go over. There are some new characters such as Waluigi and this Tomodachi looking guy. Again, I feel like we come back to the point I had with Square Enix. You could add any of these characters and you chose Tomodachi when you could have put in Kuma? The custom items are gone, which is a shame, but I feel like the game benefits from having a bit more of a simpler pick up and play aspect to it, even if it is a little less interesting. Something I actually do like about these games is they started assigning each racer three random items per race, which adds this almost roguelike game of chance to Mario Kart, which is uncontrollable, but it brings in that right amount of chaos. Then of course, there are these god-awful Snapchat filters you can put on that will float above your head as you're racing against your friends. And now at the end of each Grand Prix, there's a fifth stage that serves as this bonus mission mode-like game. See, there you go, someone saw the potential in DS. And while not all the courses are amazing and have to be designed fairly simple given the fact this is an arcade machine, I'm honestly blown away with how good some of these level aesthetics are. Like Mario Kart 8 never decided to dip in here for its DLC, like Pack Lab Diamond City, Rainbow Coaster, literally all the Yoshi courses. There's some good stuff here. The only other real thing of note is how insufferable the announcer of this game is. Mario, a great start. Not only is his wine delivery terrible, but he also just never shuts the hell up. Waluigi, blast off. Waluigi, picks up points in one stretch. Waluigi, takes a shot. Waluigi, picks up points. Wow, Donkey Kong. Waluigi, shut your fucking mouth. Let me tell you, if you're starting to remind me of the announcer from Crosstag, you're doing a bad job. But who wasn't doing a bad job was the chads over at Next Level Games, as two years after their smash hit Strikers, we now have Strikers Charged Football. Dude, we've been over this. On account of the fact that your island is about the size of Uncle Sam's left foot, but you're in the minority here. You're still wrong though. Adam, which version of the game are you playing? Uh, only for emulation's sake, the, the US version. That's right, baby, you Let's just crack on with it. Mario Strikers is back on the Wii and wee woo! Is it obvious they went all out on this one? Going over the game again would be redundant as looking at the two games, it's obvious the main formula was hardly touched. That doesn't mean, however, there weren't some neat changes. You can now select which supports you take in with you. It doesn't have to be free of the same. Not that it was going to stop my army of head bashing toads, just committing mass assault on the field anyway. What's changed though is now characters have unique abilities outside of their super strike. Not that they're really worth mentioning, is the only one to worry about is Waluigi's, who taps into his inner Joseph Joe Star, uses Hermit Pearl, and puts up a wall of vines where you can't get to him, allowing him to charge up a free Super Strike. Super Strikes are also now a bit different as they got ramped up a bit. They just look so cool and have moments of character uniqueness. But now, as a defense, you're not just a sitting duck. You have the chance to play this little mini game and block incoming shots by grabbing them on the screen. There's also a lot more to do now in this game as aside from just matches and training, there's the Road to Striker Cup, where you essentially enter a tournament to become the best. Think the Premier League. There's also a mission mode, which I know a certain someone will want to hear about. Hey Joe, this game is a mission mode. You know, I'm never gonna turn down a mission mode. Damn right. And these have some basic story behind them too. It's nothing exciting, it's just some text giving you a detailed rundown of what's going on. That's because all the excitement went into this insanely well-made intro. I'd love to say the Mario Striker series is only going up from here, but well, 
I'm still not sure why companies make such a good IP and then go ahead and ruin it, but I suppose I'm used to it at this point. Like how Joe's now used to talk about Mario Party for five minutes at a time. Yeesh, we went a whole year and a half without a new Mario Party game. You almost scared me for a second there, Nintendo. I was I was getting lonely. Mario Party 8 is the first Mario Party game for the Wii, and I wish it were the last, but again, we'll get there soon enough. This video isn't called the Ultimate Mario Retrospective up until Mario Party 9 now, is it? Wait, that, that actually sounds so much easier. A Adam, is it too late to make it that- Hold that in. Mario Party 8 is a pretty different game from its predecessors on the GameCube. While the formula is still the same old, same old, roll the dice, play the games, get the stars, hide the bodies, it changes up quite a bit from what we had started getting used to. First of all, the worst decision in Mario Party was ever made in this game. They got rid of the orbs in place of candy. The candy in this game isn't bad, all things considered, though. It basically comes in two forms, one where you eat it and it affects your form, giving you some kind of bonus or invulnerability, or one that directly messes with another player, bringing up this dartboard, letting you steal coins, stars, or maybe even dueling them. While I prefer the orbs for the chaos that they can bring and the strategy that comes with placing traps on the board, allowing you to create gauntlets of a hell road, or protecting somewhere you think the star might spawn, I think these candies are as good as a supplement can get. And hey, they even all have unique design changes on the characters, depending on which one you eat. Bolo, Bit Size, and Vampire being some of my personal favorites. Like some of the games prior, there is a single player story mode. It's nothing new at this point. I'm running out of reasons to even talk about them. It's pretty identical to Mario Party 7's where you do these 1v1 matchups on all the boards. And that's pretty much it. Like yes, playing this and the main party game and maybe even some of the sub modes award you with tickets that you can use to go buy collectibles either in the form of different characters or mini games or trinkets, whatever, it's all here. But going forward, I'm going to just not talk about these things unless they're atrociously bad. Look at the length of the video, you'll, you, you just gotta let Adam and I have this one, okay? We've been working on this for seven months now. I will mention at least before we move on that the story mode does give you two unlockable characters being Hammerbro and Blooper, and these are their first appearances in these games, but that's really all that's worth mentioning. Now, the main difference in the game is that it utilizes Nintendo's shiny new console of the Wii, by running the game in four by three aspect, huh. While Strikers had some light implementation of the motion controls and IR capabilities, Mario Party 8 was front and center with this. Pressing a button to roll the dice? Don't be stupid. You gotta swing the remote like you're hitting the block. Wanna navigate menus with buttons? Nonsense. Crank out that sensor bar because it's an aim to play kind of game. You wanna mash a button to shake a soda can? Nonsense. With the Wii Remote's infinite capabilities, now you can, uh, well, some mini games use buttons, so that, uh, that's good. We got those going for us. This was an early Wii game, which meant a lot of these mini games are kind of waggle fests, but honestly, they're not even too bad, and that wasn't the whole experience. The game manages to have a really healthy mix of mini games that uses the sensor, motion control, and standard buttons. They knew when to reel it in, unlike a lot of other bootleg party games that came out on the Wii, that somehow used the motion capabilities for everything and nothing at the same time. Next to Mario Party 6, this was the one me and my siblings played the most as kids, so I am a little bit nostalgic for it. The boards are pretty good, or the peak in the franchise. The mini games hold up well enough and there's a good amount of side content to keep yourself busy with here. I see people holding this game in high regards even to this day. I mean, one of my best friends of all time still plays Mario Party 8 with her family on a fairly regular basis. It's a shame with all that practice, I'm still better than her. Isn't that right, Athena? While I do have more to say about this game's development and reception, I'm gonna be saving all of that for when we get to Mario Party 9. So for now, this game is really good and I like it a lot. Uh, that's all it needs. Let's move on. Also, this year in Japan, a game called Itadakai Street came out. Listen, I have a lot to say about this small little chunk of the Mario spinoff franchise, but I'm going to cover all of that when we get to Fortune Street in 2011. So for now, let's just focus on... Hey, what... What's that noise? Adam, what are you doing back there? Finally! You know how long it's been since I've gotten to talk about something that isn't a stupid art or educational game? Dude, you literally just talked about baseball! But this one has my funny blue guy in it! <sighs> well, I suppose it's only fair. Your Sonic video did kind of tank. It wasn't that bad, was it? Well, let me put it like this. The Mario Party 5 video I uploaded on our footage tracking channel somehow has over 10 times the amount of views your Sonic video does. Huh? 
Why? Honestly, I couldn't tell you. Wait, where were we? Sonic the Hedgehog! And Mario! After years of fans from both worlds begging, and with a constant stream of Nintendo saying, <laughs> we finally have the Sonic and Mario crossover we've all yearned for. Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games! And it's sports. It's okay, eight-year-old Adam. But we'll be coming round the corner any time now. You can make Sonic and Mario fight then. It'll be okay. Remember Mario Party 8 minigames? Each one using the Wiimote in fun different ways. Well, that's what we're doing here. Only now instead of it being Birdo, we have the ultimate life form. This game was everything to me as a kid, and even now going back to play it for this video was a blast. The variety in sports is incredible, and this game boasts one of the most critically underrated soundtracks, with Mario and Sonic remixes alike. The cast is awesome, with all the guys you'd expect from each franchise, and each of them go into their own speciality group based on their stats. I mean, hey, any game that lets us play as Eggman is a 10 out of 10 as far as I'm concerned. It's a standard spin-off in terms of production values, but for a Wii game this looks great. Obviously the budget went more on the game content and not exactly voice actors, making it not particularly discreet when Sonic just straight up uses voice lines from Sonic Unleashed. Here we go! This game also came with its own handheld counterpart as well, and did you like waggling the Wii Remote? Well, now you can waggle the stylus! In both versions, you can either just play the events by yourself or with friends, make a sort of playlist and play a circuit of events, or take on the game's mission mode. Someone please acknowledge Mario Kart DS! We get it, Joe! Mario Kart DS did a good thing! It's standard stuff, really. Get a certain distance in free throws, or aim high and achieve... third place. Okay then. This evidently was a huge hit given its sheer amount of sports minigames and character variety, as the Mario vs Sonic Olympic Games games are still being made to this day. Now as much as we'd love to go over every future installment in its franchise and point out the superfluous changes like adding two new characters or maybe even a new menu option? Do one! There's a good 12 games in this franchise here. Now evidently when you take something as repetitive as kart racing this is A-OK, -okay. but as soon as it's something I care to talk about, nope, it's off the table. So because I'm not allowed to be happy, it's time to blast through these at sonic speed. You ready Joe? We literally just told you. And now it's portable. Now it's snowing. Now it's portable. Now it's British. Now it's in 3D and portable. It snowed again? Now it's in Rio. Now it's portable. Wait, what? Now it's an arcade machine. <laughs> Now it's an arcade machine again! Finishing in Tokyo! And that's pretty much it. Yes, it's strange that Sonic and Shadow can't demolish the 100 meter dash before anyone else does, but let's also remember from his other racing games, Sonic is clearly a good sport. Ooh, are we done here yet? Are you done with Nintendo trying to make Mario Party work on a handheld? What? Nothing! On to the next game now, Joe! Back to Mario only! Woo woo! Nintendo must have felt really bad about skipping 2006 with that whole yearly party release strategy, because like in 2005, we have a second portable Mario Party game to talk about this year, with the titular Mario Party DS. This game, put simply, is what everyone wanted Mario Party Advance to be, but they knew it could never be. That being, actually fucking Mario Party! No cars, no fetch quests, none of that! You've got actual boards where you run around, collect coins, play mini games, buy stars, and hey, look at that! You can even weave traps on the ground like orbs! It's what I've been saying, guys! Fucking no one ever listens to me about these orbs! I can't believe I'm going to say this, but Mario Party DS actually has a theme? To explain that, we have to get a little bit into the story of DS, which, unlike Mario Party 8, see here actually is kind of creative. The whole gimmick is that Mario and the gang are hanging out when letters rain from the sky. They're from Bowser inviting the gang over to apologize for being such a big jerk. I'm sure this can't go wrong. Son of a bitch. Yeah, so Bowser found this magic shrinking rod doohickey and shrinks all our favorite characters and then just kind of throws them outside. So after the past eight games of learning that friendship really is the solution to all their problems, they decide they want to work together to find a solution to this problem. Just kidding. Everyone wants to be an absolute Chad and save everyone. So when faced with someone who can help them out, instead of solving the problem, they have to play around a Mario Party every time to decide who gets to be the person to help someone out. The rest of the single player mode is exactly what you're expecting. The only unique thing is that there's a boss mode at the end of each board, which is kind of cool. But the reason I bring it all up in general is because it really sets a precedence for what's going on here. 
the gimmick of everyone being shrunk to size is because the game is being played on a smaller console and they do not skimp on this idea at all the board see you running around mundane locations but from the perspective of ants like a garden or a music room and almost all the mini games are based off of the idea of being small as well the closest we got to an overall theme in a mario party game was mario party 6 but even i can't say that it was better there because they just really knocked this idea out of the park here while i've bashed the idea of a single player mode in mario party i feel like it's so much more justified on a handout like this because it's something you can actively do by yourself if you're playing this in the car or at school or something I mean, hell, from personal experience, I remember playing this game in the car to the beach when I was a kid. And like I mentioned in Mario Kart DS, I used to play this game with my neighbor across the street because this game also had digital download play. No longer do we need link cables. Everyone can just hop on download play and it's smooth soap surfing from there. And while you might not feel the need to go for collectibles in the console Mario Party games, if you've got it on a portable and you've got nothing to do for a few hours, why not, right? Not like you've got friends or anything to talk to. <laughs> it's honestly kind of weird only realizing while making this video, but the DS's versions of Party and Kart were some of the best to date? They just seemed the most inspired and had so much care and creativity put into them, and they each had these crazy good implementations that were just never brought back in a future game, like motifs or mission modes or stuff like that. Way to go, Mario Party DS. Glad to see after all these years you still hold up. I know we've been kind of cruising, but man, it's been an amazing few years. Basically, all the games since 2003 have either been really interesting or really good. It is around this point, though, that you're going to start to realize how much the spin-offs have changed over time. Not even necessarily through their quality, though. Back in the 90s and even the early 2000s, we used to get more niche titles like Picross, Mario vs. Wario, a freaking shogi simulator. But over the past few years, and you'll start to see in the following, it seems like the spin-offs are exclusively cart, party, and sports games, with occasional breaks off the beaten path. This isn't inherently a bad thing, it's just something worth mentioning now that we've gotten comfortable with this formula. But I suppose we better get on with it as we enter the year 2008. Hold it right there, Joe. What, what is this? What are we doing now? Breaking news about a catastrophic storm coming through the area. Are, are you serious? Oh, come on, man, just, just play what? the part. Wait, just, what? just play along, Joe. I've got something going here, you How okay? How can you possibly know Good. that? Just, just go with it, it's for the flow of the video. What do you know about the I flow know plenty, of the video? Mate. I'm the author of the script here. Just think it's just all just you, you and really always you. Keep interrupting I don't my just to if do you could ever just <sighs> that sounds really important reporter talking to me through the tv i haven't had this whole time why don't we throw it over to the weather room great now? idea joe let's throw it over to adam with the weather <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Well, Joe, we're seeing a serious rise in rainfall blowing over the area, so everyone at home should be expecting some occasional thunder and a 100% chance of a lightning round. Seriously? In 2008, we kicked off the year with the release of the WiiWare title Dr. Mario RX, which was the third installment in the Dr. Mario franchise, and the series returned for the first time in seven years. The game featured the classic Dr. Mario gameplay alongside a new mode called Germ Buster in online mode, where players could face up against each other in classic pill-popping action. Then later that year, for the DSi eShop, Nintendo released Dr. Mario Express, which was Dr. Mario RX, but without the online play or germ buster mode so basically a waste of time speaking of pointless let's shoot forward to 2009 when nintendo re-released mario power tennis under the new play control line of games oh boy with a fancy name like that i'm sure they must have added a bunch of new features well if you're interested in swinging the remote like a tennis racket in a less immersive way then this is the game for you that's really all there is here aside from putting the game in 16 by 9 white screen but we're not done yet because with 2009 is the year of pointless releases as we have two more dsi titles to talk about with the mario clock and calculator they are exactly as they sound Hey, I actually used Mario Clock as my alarm growing up. Your life makes me sad. Almost as sad as I would feel when losing in Mario Party Fugishi no Kokoroko Kacha. Just like the older Kokoroko games, this is an arcade machine where you play a digital washdown version of a Mario Party game, this time using assets from 8, and playing minigames both in and outside the machine. Wow, what a great machine that we'll never get to play. Just like 2011's New Super Mario Bros. Coin World Machine, this is basically a Mario slot machine, plain and simple, but flavoured off the New Super Mario Bros. games and developed by Capcom. Not much to say about this one other than I read these two comments in particular when gathering the footage for the segment, and I really hope these two are okay. Well, that's all we've got here at the studio. Back to you, Joe. Wow, that certainly cleaned up the next few years, huh? You're welcome. <coughs> Anyways, 
Let's hop into the actual games of this year. Oh man, now this is a big one. Mario Kart Wii was a phenomenon when it came out, and the fact it was one of the biggest games on the holiday console, the Nintendo Wii, many saw this as a huge recipe for success. While I have some memories of playing Double Dash with my sisters, Mario Kart Wii is the one I remember us sitting down and playing all the time. Dude, I remember one time I got hit by like a red shell or something, and I said shoot, and my brain told me they're gonna think I said shit. And lo and behold, I continued to get gaslit for the remainder of the play session. But now I can say whatever I want! I'm a YouTuber, damn it! Freedom of speech is finally within my. While Mario Kart Wii didn't have any huge gimmicks brought to the table like we saw in Double Dash or any new crazy single player mode experiences that were a masterclass for their time, like in Mario I Kart DS, not only did this game introduce a boatload of carts for each weight class with some really cool designs and would automatically alter the color palette based off the racer you chose, but this game also was the series debut and funeral for motorbikes. Alongside the new trick system, which meant you could flick the Wii remote or C stick when going off a ramp to do a trick and gain a speed boost off the ground, which made certain stages way more fun that let you build up way more speed. They were trying to give carts and bikes different attributes to incentivize picking one over the other. Sure, carts got better boosts and more consistent turning, but bikes were able to pop wheelies for speed boosts, and yeah, bikes are just far superior. As a kid, I remember trying to do wheelies, but I just wasn't good at it at all, so I just never did it. So when I picked this game back up for recording this video years later, it became immediately apparent what people were talking about. I was hitting speeds I didn't even know were possible, during sections of stages. Despite them being busted from a competitive standpoint, I thought they were really cool and a natural progression for the formula. They just need a bit of tweaking. Hell, even if they are mechanically identical to carts, I want to be thugging it out as baby Luigi, goddammit! Again, given how far we are into this video, I'm trying to speed these sections up, but the courses in this game are really iconic for me. Some standouts being Mushroom Gorge, Coconut Mall, DK Summit, Rainbow Road, and even Luigi Circuit are some that I look back on fondly. As for the characters, Mario Kart Wii has a total of 25, beating Double Dash's count of 20. Out of these characters, the newcomers to the series are Baby Peach, Baby Daisy, Bonky Kong, Dry Bowser, and of course, Rosalina. She was kind of a big deal at the time because she was only in Mario Galaxy prior to this. And in a previous video, I mentioned how this game actually might have given her more mass appeal than Galaxy, but I'll have more to say about her later. Mario Kart Wii also has some of the most asinine unlock conditions in the entire franchise, and while this might be a detractor for some, I actually think it's kind of one of its selling points. One of the major problems with Mario Kart games, at least for me, is that there really isn't any reason or reward for playing the game solo. Like in Double Dash and DS, there are some unlockables and rewards to go for, but they kind of felt like afterthoughts. Minus, of course, God's given grace that is the mission mode. Oh, will you shut the fuck up about mission mode? But Mario Kart Wii, on the other hand, has a boatload of cups, characters, and cards to unlock. While arguably you could unlock almost everything from just doing the races, the game encourages you to try out the time trials and beat dev times to unlock more characters. Also, like, what do you think is going to be quicker to unlock Toadette? Playing all the time trials at least once, or playing over 2,500 races? Wait, you don't want Toadette? Then of course, there was online play carried over from DS but expounded upon entirely with time-based tournaments that give you similar missions to the previous game. There were a handful of battle modes with a bunch of new and old courses to play on. There was the introduction of team races, which I remember fondly playing with my sisters. This was the first game you could play as your me, and when you would beat an entire speed category, you'd get a postcard sent to your Wii message board congratulating you. And in case this all wasn't enough for you, there's one of the largest, most creative modding communities I've ever seen online, with thousands upon thousands of new courses and custom characters that you can add to your game to spice up the gameplay. There even are dedicated fan-held servers to bring back online functionality. Needless to say, Mario Kart Wii was and still is a big deal. Whether or not it's the most up-to-date or content-packed game in the franchise, Mario Kart Wii is a landmark title and a favorite among so many play- Hey, wait! Stop playing the music! I'm not done here yet! I haven't even mentioned the Wii Wii! Alright, I'm not even going to lead in with a joke about this one. Mario Super Sluggers is in my top three games in the video, bar none, so let's just dive right into it. Mario Super Sluggers is, of course, a sequel to Mario Superstar Baseball on the GameCube. And while I personally opted out of playing that one, courtesy of Adam, this might be one of the most played Wii games I have. Now, while I've never been a huge fan of sports in general, shocker, I know, look at me, I'm the physical embodiment of athleticism, this was a game I played both alone and with family for countless hours. So what's so special about it? 
Well, for starters, it does have a full-blown campaign mode, and it's a lot better than almost all the other story modes in these sports games so far. Some of you might be quick to point out that the first baseball game had a campaign mode we didn't really talk about. Well, that's just honestly because it was pretty simple. You kind of just ran around contesting other captains. Meanwhile, in Sluggers, it feels like a full-blown adventure. Bowser Jr. has invaded you and your friend's baseball-themed vacation. Him and all of Bowser's baddies are running around causing problems in all of the character-based locations, such as Mario's Beach, Wario's City, Peach's Garden. So it's up to Mario and all these characters to run around and save the day, playing little baseball challenges to get your friends to join you in your battle against Bowser Jr. I feel like Mario and the crew just spin a wheel at the start of the week to decide what they're going to use for conflict resolution that day. On this adventure, not only do you get to play as Peach, Yoshi, Wario, and even Donkey Kong, with their own unique abilities that help them get to new locations and make different friends, but there's also a handful of mini games in the package, and I think they're a lot better than some of the ones we've had previously. They're no better than the average Mario Party mini games, but I still think they're a good time, and the fact that you can unlock more of them and they're used for more challenges in the campaign mode is a pretty cool way to tie things all together. Speaking of unlockables, not only is there a boatload of characters from across the entire Mario canon up to this point, even some deep pulls such as the Kremlings and King K. Rule, but there's also a lot more that you can unlock in this campaign mode, such as shops to buy items, some of which including extra courses like Daisy's Cruiser and Luigi's Mansion, which each come with their own additional minigames, but you can also unlock a day and night cycle, but there it is! There's the common thread! My favorite games have a day and night cycle! And while I know a campaign mode with a bunch of basically tutorials for challenges could seem like it's a little annoying, Swuggers avoids this in a few different ways. For starters, every mission you complete, you're unlocking a new character. Or at the very least, you're defeating someone in your path to get to more characters. But accompanied by the just triumphant ass music that plays between these sections, it's just really rewarding. <laughs> The game almost feels more like a collectathon, if you will. Going to each of the unique locations and getting all the characters, chests, and minigames, it's just really fun and satisfying. But also, if you just really don't want to waste the time playing the whole campaign mode, you can blitz from the start of the game to the end in 25 minutes max. Like, all you really need is 9 characters to play baseball with, so that basically means you need to get through the tutorial in Mario's Island, then get one other character from one of the 4 other locations, and then you can just sprint to the final boss. Who literally I'll play on screen right now, I beat the entire game in like 20 minutes. Then for the gameplay itself, it's the perfect mix of chaotic and competitive. Yes, while it's standard baseball affair, there are a bunch of little gimmicks and unique mechanics that make it really special. Throwing items onto the field, this chemistry mechanic, there's a lot of cool stuff here. We would spend days of them at my house just slaving away at this game. One of my favorite things I remember us doing was we would make full teams of Miis. Like, we would spend hours making all these funny custom Miis and then making these huge, like, 9v9 competitive modes of our Miis. I'm kind of rambling. Let's get back on track. Honestly, the more I played this game for the video, it really made me realize I just kind of want to make a video about this game more than anything else so far because I love the campaign. I love all the characters. The, the gameplay is just so good. I'll come back to this one in the future. Mark my words. But Swuggers just raised the standard of what a Mario sports game could be. And I think it's the peak of the golden era and I'm going to dive into it. Uh, dude, okay, I'm sorry. So much of this section has just been so awesome off script. Please just throw us into the next one. Good game. Uh, did you get that yet? It's a good game. It's a good game, you guys. Since everything released this year has already briefly been gone over or excluded from this video, we actually have a little bit of downtime. I'm going to use this opportunity to point out how the changing landscape for the Mario franchise has been. Starting in 2009, we actually start to see a decline in the quantity of games coming out, which each year we were averaging about 4-6 to six games, but going forward, it's going to be closer to 1-3. to three. Maybe Nintendo was starting to get a bit stingier, or maybe they were just trying to focus on quality over quantity. Well, with that initiative in the way, let's see what game they came out with next. Mario Sports Mix thrusts the gang into four whole different sports this time around. Three series debuts such as hockey, volleyball, and dodgeball, and of course, the returning basketball. This was a spiritual successor to Mario Hoops 3 on 3, as it was made by the same team at Square Enix. Which means we see the return of the funny avatars and cactus, alongside the slime from Dragon Quest. 
I'm not going to go crazy in depth about each of these games considering I've already talked about basketball. Dodgeball is fun but self-explanatory, hockey is just soccer on ice, and volleyball is just... Volleyball. While all these games are pretty drastically different from one another, they kind of follow the same mechanics. There are coins and items to be picked up during the game to modify points or shots. You have the same selection of stages for each game with a universal gimmick that gets slightly varied depending on the sport, and each character has a unique super move, usually fitting around a theme. Each sport has an arcade mode where you play through brackets of increasing difficulty until you get to the Star Cup where Ninja and crew ambush you. The fuck you say to me, you little shit? Try to steal the trophy, you beat them, beat this game, get the gem, do this for all four games until you fight Behemoth from Final Fantasy. So standard Mario sports game fair. And while there are some mini games in the package, none of them are really exceptional. While previous sports games we've talked about have included upwards of five in some cases, all with really creative uses of the IP, Mario Sports Mix, you only get one apiece. And while they can be a decent distraction, none of them are really my cup of tea. Oh my god, dude. Okay, so this isn't even in the script at all, but the volleyball mini game is this like rhythm game where you have to hit the ball to the beat, but there's no skill to it. You just have to run to the circle and just stand there, and it's so slow and so boring. It is the worst side mode in a Mario sports game. Aside from this though, even though I've kind of just run over the basics of sports mix, I really do like it. I used to play it all the time when I was younger, and I actually played the online mode a good amount. The weird thing though is just that it's so basic that I don't have too much to say. All the games are decently fun, except for volleyball, and they're good to be played solo or even with friends. But it's just very simple. That's not bad, I really like it. And it's gonna be high up in the overall ranking, but this game does get a lot of flack online for kind of being the start of the decline for Mario spinoff games, but honestly, that's not really fair. I mean, some of the stages, even if they are kind of recycled from Mario Hoops 3 on 3, are really colorful and fun, and a lot of the gimmicks can really spice up an average sport. Because there's so many sports in this package, it's hard for it to stand out on its own. That doesn't make it bad, it just might make it a little less memorable for some people. And besides, I hardly think it's fair to call this game the decline considering it wasn't even made by Nintendo. But hey, being a subpar Mario sports game is still leagues better than the competition. I mean, do you know how many Sonic spin-off games try to be at that quality? I'm looking at you, Sonic All-Star Tennis. One of the biggest disappointments of my childhood, believe me. And then you can fucking chime in here if you have anything funny to add to that, but I'm telling you, dude, I played that game as a kid and it was okay at best. <laughs> maybe it's, maybe it's... 2011 was definitely an interesting year in regards to Nintendo's release strategy. With the Wii basically one foot in the grave and the other in the retirement fund, people were getting ready to pack their Wiis in the closet and make room for what console was coming next. But Nintendo had one last... Square Enix had one last attempt to persuade players over, and little did they know it was going to be the best game on the fucking <laughs> So anyone out there ever play Monopoly? Now if your answer is no because the game usually takes way too long and can get too competitive and cause arguments, you are an ignorant <laughs> Fortune Street is essentially if you took Monopoly, added a stock market economy, and smacked Mario Party in there. Looks great, right? This is the third installment in the Square Enix lineup of Mario crossovers, this time pulling from their Dragon Quest titles rather than Final Fantasy. And unlike those previous entries, we actually get a pretty good slew of characters here. And it's not just generic NPC or mob, we actually get some named characters. The core gameplay loop of the game is pretty easy to grasp once you get the hang of it. You run around the board trying to collect four suits so you can return to the bank and get a paycheck, like a slightly more involved version of passing go in Monopoly, to which you can spend your money at the bank to invest in certain colors of spaces called districts. Whenever someone lands on a color you've invested in, you get some kickback at the profits. And if a property goes up in value in a district you own stocks in, that's where the profits really start rolling in. Your goal is to get your network, meaning the accumulation of your stocks and property value, up to a predetermined goalpost and be the first to make it back to the bank. Or alternatively, be the player with the highest net worth before a player bankrupts. Although this mode is optional, it's kind of like a mercy rule, but that's besides the point. When you sprinkle in blank spaces, which essentially let you pick from a boatload of unique gimmicky properties with all different effects, the game is just perfect. <laughs> Now, as you might remember, this isn't the sole entry in this series. We actually mentioned it a few years ago when it was on the DS in Japan. But this series actually has existed before and even after its renditions on the Nintendo consoles, under the same name Itadaki Street. 
These games mainly take place with Dragon Quest and even Final Fantasy characters, and they're still making them to this day. It's a shame because I feel like the reason we haven't gotten any more of these games is because Nintendo and Square decided to try throwing it to an American audience on a dying console in its last two years of relevancy. No wonder it didn't sell well. But regardless, like with Sluggers, this is a game I want to fully dedicate a deep dive into just because of how much I enjoy it. This isn't even going over all the cool stuff you can do with customizing your character and the full campaign mode with the boatload of fan service dialogue. There's still a lot to talk about here, but Jesus Christ, look at the length of the video. I just don't have time. So I'll leave you with the fact that this is the only Wii game I have consistently played since I got it years ago, just based on how good it is. And if you're a fan of Mario Party, get an emulator, find a copy of it online, or petition for it. Well folks, as soon as we got there, we are officially out of the Wii era and into the 3DS era, with its first release, Mario Kart 7. While I've tried to leave out any development history from these entries because, again, look at the time, I do find it necessary to point out just how damn essential Mario Kart 7 was for the 3DS. Considering that this was the lineup of games we had at the console's launch, and that it cost this much, the 3DS struggled during its launch year. Now, eventually, the console would get a price cut, which helped a ton, but it really took a few titles to validate a purchase of a 3DS. And the first one to start that movement was Mario Kart 7. One could easily argue this game has some of the most innovations that any have brought into the franchise, with the inclusion of customizable carts, gliders, and underwater sections. What once were inaccessible death pits or forced movement sections have become fully traversable areas, which really opened up the door for track design. Once again, I don't have time to review all of them, but some of my personal favorites are DK Jungle, Rosalina's Ice World, Neo Bowser City, Music World, Shy Guy Bazaar, and of course, Mario Kart 7's rendition of Rainbow Road. Also, I won't spend too much time on it, but the roster in this game, though, is kind of bizarre. All the new inclusions are yellow. This was the year Nintendo decided to give the gang Salmonella. Also, someone from the game's development team during a press conference said that they couldn't include Waluigi because they were afraid he would scare kids. What? Alongside the character roster, Seven also shook up the item roster a fair amount. With it being the debut of the Fire Flower, which is weird to think it took us this long to get the first power up, and the tail. This also meant the return of Coin, a mechanic that had been absent since Super Mario Kart, but a welcome return, allowing for players to have a little bit more strategy when it came to increasing their max speed. And it was also a neat way for players to unlock car parts. Although I do kind of wish that we got to use these coins at a shop or something rather than just milestones but whatever. Oh, and speaking of, really quick, I gotta throw it in here. While scripting this section, I did actually pull up the Mario Kart wiki to make sure I wasn't missing anything, and for some reason, the mad lads on that site have gone out of their way to put a whole section based on the items removed and labeling it why they... None of this has any actual relevancy, like there's no evidence backing up these claims, but I found it really weird that the one that you could most obviously make a point for, being the POW block, is just a worse lightning strike. And the only way that you could avoid it is by shaking your Wii remote, which you obviously don't want to do with your 3DS screen. That's the one they couldn't figure out? Also, why is this section here? You don't have any official sources. Add the Mario Kart wiki editors to my list of ever-growing enemies. Oh, <laughs> whatever. I'm, I'm seriously stalling long enough. Finally, we can get to talking about the mission mode. Uh, buddy, you know there isn't a mission mode, right? What? Of course there is. You need a mission mode for a portable Mario Kart. Evidently, your Golden Boy Nintendo disagrees. No, that's that's not possible. Mission mode was the best. Oh, bloody hell, he's done it to himself again. I don't know why he thinks he pays me enough to keep this video going for him. And of course, he conks out one of the blandest titles we've seen in a hot minute. Mario's been playing tennis for 20 years now at this point. What is there to say? Well, what is worth noting is that this is the first tennis game on a portable that plays like a console tennis game. Gone are the RPGs and lesser graphics, as here we have a console experience on a handheld, which should be commended. And that's about as much as I care to commend as Mario Tennis Open is baffling to me. To start with, why is Luma playable and Rosalina isn't? If this doesn't set the tone of what's going on in this game, I'm not overly sure what will. Tennis Open lends itself to being on the 3DS and makes great use of both screens. Each type of shot can be performed with the corresponding button inputs, or you can press its colour tile on the touchscreen, which does make the game more accessible. However, keep in mind this colour tiled approach, and how it takes this concept and then shoots itself in the foot. Let's rip the bandage off immediately. In the last entry on the GameCube we saw power shots, a bit of a pace breaking but awesome addition that would deliver an insane shot to your opponent. In Tennis Open, we have chance shots. What are they I hear you asking? First of all, it's very rude to interrupt others while they're talking, but I'll let it slide this 
this time if you like the video. Chance shots are how we're doing special shots in this game, and in concept, it's fine. Get to the coloured circle on the court and do the shot type that corresponds to that colour. Simple. Until you realise the space will always appear where the ball is going to land, removing any challenge tennis had. For comparison, that's like going to a roulette table and the dealer tells you every time where the ball is going to land. Other than being a winner, what's the point? But what do I know? I'm not Andy Murray, am I? Uh, yeah, tennis, mini games, and disappointment. Surprisingly, like my seventh birthday party. Four out of ten. All right, then, that time's over. Up you get. Anything around here I can use as smelling salts? That'll do. The fuck the course. All right, fellas, it only took us way too long, but we're. Finally here! People will try to tell you that Sports Mix was the turning point for the Mario spin-offs. Well, I disagree. Full stop. Get it? Stop? Stop because there's a car? <laughs> all right, I've alluded to talking about this all in one place earlier in the video, so it's time for my new segment, Joe's Review Roundup. So we already knew that critics threw a fit when it came to Mario Party 1, which led to Nintendo covering their asses with the release of Mario Party 2, which at that point they thought, hey, we just remade the same game for the same console within a year and made a profit, so we could do that again for the third game. Then of course it was time for the new generation of gaming with the game, wait for it, so they decided to release Mario Party 4, a graphical overhaul and showcase for a new era of Mario Party. Then you know, of course, what's a Christmas without another Mario Party, huh? Let's just throw a fifth out there on the shelves. And golly, Jennifer from Accounting just told us that the moon exists. Better make a Mario Party game to get the word out to the masses. Oh, and you know we can't end on a loss, right? You know a gambler's always one pull away from hitting a jackpot. So let's make Mario Party 7 to bring in the big bucks. And hey, now we've got a new gaming console coming out again. So we gotta make a new Mario Party for the win. Cube! It just was becoming too damn much. That's not even to mention the cavalcade of handhelds, arcade arcade machines and the frickin' card games they were releasing between these, some of which had multiple games coming out a year! Now while most of the consumers didn't have as much of a problem with this in comparison to the critics, the critics just hated it! They saw these games as taste was rehashes of the previous, almost like Nintendo's version of Call of Duty, which like, yeah they were kinda right, but no one was complaining! The weird thing that a lot of people have been divisive over when it comes to these critics' opinions was that the main thing that they were getting problems with was the fact that they were feeling bored. They tried to say that the game was too slow and that they were getting bored waiting on everyone else to take their turns, which like, yeah, I guess that's a fair criticism for some, but most fans of the series would argue that because of how competitive and chaotic these games can get, some of the most fun from the game can come from watching your friends and screaming at them for screwing you over. But Nintendo heard these cries and decided that the ninth installment of the franchise was going to change things up. If critics wanted to feel more involved during other players' turns, they had the perfect solution for that. By cramming everyone into a clown car and forcing them to move together down a linear path. No longer are we collecting coins and stars, now we're fighting over mini stars and avoiding the evil dark stars. Minigames will now be decided by minigame tiles and we'll start fighting bosses along the way. And most importantly, there will no longer be any items other than different forms of dice. Let me tell you guys a story. I remember when I was 10 years old, I decided to turn on the Nintendo Channel thing on the Wii, where they would broadcast trailers and demos. And the first thing I ever saw on that channel was the Mario Party 9 trailer. Even as a slobbering kid who liked anything with the stupid plumber on it, even I wasn't excited for this and thought it was dumb. In retrospect, I do want to at least point out that the game did do some things right. The board aesthetics were actually pretty cool for the time, being one of the first major Mario spin-offs to fully utilize that new Super Mario Bros. flair, which I know now in the bright year of 2023 we all hate, but looking back it's actually kind of cool. And the idea of fighting bosses to gain extra stars during the journey is really fun and the fact that each board had two unique bosses per run that's some dedication right there and hell the car mode itself can be fun every once in a while it just wasn't better than the proven formula if this were a side or optional mode alongside the traditional mario party i actually think it would do really well but as it stands, it just felt like a misstep and lack of recognition of what the fans wanted from the developers. It just was too different too quick. I mean, look at the list of differences in the game's Wikipedia, one of which is oddly enough the exclusion of Toadette. You don't want I'm so Toadette. sorry. 
Now, the fans had hoped that Nintendo would hear their cries about this not being what they wanted, but unfortunately for them, the critics thought differently. Just comparing the critic scores of 9 to both 8 and 7, it became unfortunately clear what this meant for the future of Mario Party, but we'll get there soon enough. Next up, we have the third installment in the Mario Kart Arcade franchise, Mario Kart Arcade GPX. Now, to be honest, this game in particular is a little difficult to talk about. Over the course of its run, it saw several updates and limited time events locking out unique characters and stages. And I also think it has some kind of Mario Kart equivalent where you can unlock additional characters, but I was having a lot of trouble understanding the Wikipedia. And considering this game isn't too much different from the other arcade machines we've talked about, I'm just gonna sum it. Essentially, it's the same game as the past two, but there are a handful of new modes and new characters with the returning item roulette. Unfortunately though, the game now only has you do one race at a time, but from personal experience, this is probably for the best. Whenever me and my friends hit the arcades, these machines are usually fully occupied, and they're there for a long time. So rather than forcing players to play a full Grand Prix, the game encourages players to just do one quick race and hop off the machine, which in my opinion is preferable for the environment these games are made for. I did actually get to play this one out in the wild though for this video, and I made sure I stomped the competition. I'm gonna edit it to make it look like I won. Uh, yep, I definitely beat that guy, so let's just move on into Mario Party Island Tour! Uh, oh, did you enjoy that 60 seconds of non-Mario Party discussion? Well, why the hell not? Not like I've got a better use of the next two minutes! So Mario Party Island Tour came out only a year after Mario Party 9, and it did feel like Nintendo was taking a step in the right direction with this game, but we're still really confused. So we've abandoned the car from 9, a good step in the right direction, but you're still forced down linear paths and it's still a race for the mini stars. Now in retrospect, I actually still don't hate this. Like with 9, I actually think there is some fun to be had here with this kind of game mode. You've got items to boost yourself and others to slow down your opponents, which can be paired greatly when you're going up against some of the stage hazards that come up on some of these boards. Which while the stages aren't very great by any means and would fall near the bottom of any other Mario Party board tier list, I think are fine. And while not all of the mini games are exactly winners, a lot of them are still really good. I remember a handful of them having some really creative uses of the touchscreen and even the gyro controls. While I don't necessarily agree with the critics' initial claims, putting people in the car did make it a little bit quicker to get through with the action. Mario Party Island Tour, on the other hand, is a step in the absolute wrong direction. Because everyone's moving on the same path and you're rolling individually, it feels like a slog. And just compare how long it takes to roll a dice in Mario Party 6 to Mario Party Island Tour. Surprisingly, I think the speed is actually this game's biggest detractor. But that's not to say that there aren't others. The problems more stem from a general lack of content and polish. There was a single player mode here, but it was laughably bad. You just play through 30 mini games, and if you get to the top, you unlock Bowser Jr., which sounds simple enough, but when all you're doing is playing a 30 second mini game, then being met with like 45 seconds of loading screens and dialogue, it's just so lame. Oh, and did I forget to mention the fact that there are luck based mini games during this gauntlet? And if you lose, you get sent back to the beginning? Yeah, there are some collectibles, but unlike previous games like Mario Party 8, where there were at least little figures or dioramas, they're just screenshots and stupid little bubbles, so what the hell's the point? I know I said in Mario Party DS that there's more of an incentive to go for collectibles because it's a handheld, but these are just so lame, why would anyone go out of their way to do that? No online play, barely any reason to play single player, and just a general lack of reason for existing. I think the most you'd get out of this game is if you're a kid and you're at some family event and someone else had their 3DS and had none of these games to play. Which is exactly how I played this game all three times I booted it up back in the day. I got it on Christmas, played it with my cousin then, one time after, and then a third time for this video. While I can respect the idea ideas from Island Tour, at the time, all the fans saw this as was the beginning of a lost streak for the party franchise, and unfortunately, it was. Jeez, between Tennis Open and Island Tour, it's really starting to look like Mario and the gang aren't having the best run on the handheld. Luckily for us though, while 2014 wasn't trying its damnedest to wipe out the human population, it was giving us a good Mario golf game. Sure beats dying, I guess. 
So it only took Nintendo a whole 10 years, but they finally decided to give Mario another shot at breaking out the 9-iron. And it's great! This is the best game in the Mario Golf series! And the best on the 3DS so far? The graphics are amazing! The stage designs are visually distinct while maintaining that classic Mario charm. And like I mentioned in Mario Party 9, while the new super aesthetic will become done to death at a certain point, I actually really enjoyed how they used it here. And they also found the time to sprinkle in references to other games like Galaxy. Don't get me wrong. I really like Toadstool Tour, but that game's stage lineup was nothing compared to Seaside Course, Yoshi's Wake, Cheap Cheap Lagoon, DK Jungle, Sparkling Waters, and Yoshi's Star- Wait! <laughs> Wait, it's called Mario Star. Why did I write Yoshi Star? <laughs> There's a boatload of single player content between tournaments, campaign mode, challenges, a far cry from the amount of content we've been dealing with lately. And what could have been a fairly small roster, given how portable Mario games tend to hone it in on the same group of schmucks we're used to, World Tour gave us 21. For context, that's not too far from how many we got on Double Dash, whose whole gimmick was that they had a boatload of characters. Sure, the main cast is there, but we also get some interesting inclusions like Nabbit, Magikoopa, Toadette, I found her guys, she's okay, and Rosalina. It's interesting to see Rosalina's return here, but we'll get to that later. So let's put a pin in that for now. But hey, don't forget, I'm going to be upset if you do. A good portion of these characters and stages actually came through DLC packs released over time. This game had a season pass, where if you bought it up front, not only would you get Golden Mario instantly, but over the next few months, you'd get all the additional DLC packs as they came out. Now, of course, practices like these aren't all too uncommon nowadays, but for 2014, and with Mario Golf of all things to try this, I'm just surprised it worked so well. Probably has to do with the fact that the base game already had a good foundation and was an ample amount of content to build off of. Instead of just using DLC as an excuse to release games in an incomplete state to the point where by the time the DLC comes out, people don't care about your game anymore because the core game wasn't enjoyable enough to warrant further interest. That would be ridiculous! <laughs> Man, we're really using that one a lot recently, huh? Hey man, I'm just the artist, and that was my artistic choice. How the hell do you justify a car crash as an artistic choice? Well, why don't you look at what game's coming up next and tell me if you see the bigger picture? Fine! Maybe I win- Okay, can we tone down the music a bit? Let me speak! So Mario Kart 8 has become a bit bigger of a title than initially anticipated, and requires a bit of conversation. Let's get this out of the way. It's Mario Kart, okay? Oh, and I get it! But really good Mario Kart! Not only is this the first HD installment in the franchise, which means the game looks great, but also a culmination of some of the best ideas from across the franchise. First of which, you know the drill, the game has a bunch of great tracks. My list of favorites being Toad Harbor, Shy Guy Falls, Sunshine Airport, Electrodome, and Rainbow Road. Just kidding, no one likes this stage. But on top of that, it also has some really good returning tracks. With Moo Moo Meadows, DK Jungle, Music Park, and Piranha Plant Slide. And given that this game sees the return of not only underwater and flight mechanics from Seven, but also through the use of its anti-gravity mechanic, it allows the course designers to revamp some of these stages with whole new layouts and mechanics in really fun ways. Some most evidently seen with Sherbert Land, Donut Plains 3, Mario Circuit, and Royal Raceway. Of course, custom cart parts are back as well, which make for a good enough unlockable, alongside stamps that could have been used for Miiverse, but again, see the graveyard. <laughs> giving players a pretty decent amount of single player content to hunt down, alongside, of course, the characters. The roster of Mario Kart 8 is a pretty divisive topic in the community, given the abundance of toddlers, robots, and gremlins, but I don't know, I think it's kind of funny. Like, yeah, of course I want to toss these children in the nearest Taco Bell dumpster, and it did feel super lame to get rid of Marky Mark, but keep the funky bunch, but I always felt that this kind of jank roster gave the game its identity. The gameplay of Mario Kart 8 itself is pretty great, no doubt, but I've always felt like its aesthetic personally was just a little bland. Hot day considering Mario Kart Wii's identity was the color white, which just so happens to be mine as well, but at least we had celebration ceremonies and would send you cute little letters to your Wii message board when you would complete Grand Prix. Oh, and it also had that! Where Mario Kart 8 has this news sport network thing going on, which works for it, but I always found it kind of boring. Like, yeah, you can put me in the DNV for a few hours, but at least I'm sitting next to Lemmy. 
The game ended up also getting some DLC packs, including more characters and courses, even from outside the Mario universe, such as Zelda, Animal Crossing, and even a new ghost theme stage. Sure, if I looked hard enough, there are things to complain about. Like, yeah, the frame rate drops when you play multiplayer, there's no original battle mode track, and the amiibo support got dropped pretty early on. These are all honestly superfluous. The gameplay and visuals here are the best the series has ever seen, which is why Nintendo decided to bring it back for the new console with Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Yeah, I'm gonna be jumping ahead a bit here for simplicity's sake, but Mario Kart 8 Deluxe is honestly an enigma. At the beginning of the video, you might have remembered me mentioning how Deluxe is one of the highest selling video games of all time. Man, remember that? That was almost two hours ago now. Well, it's crazy because this game is essentially just an enhanced port. And it sold how many copies? That's over seven times the amount that the base game sold. Well, I guess it's not too hard to believe. The base game of 8 was already amazing. It was just birthed on a rotting corpse. Deluxe also is, plain and simple, an improvement in every way. More characters, more tracks, all DLC included for free, an improved battle mode, and a boatload of new tracks and characters added through the booster passes. Man, Nintendo sure does know how to support a game post-launch, huh? Probably has something to do with the fact that the base game in the package already had a bunch of content and a really good player base, so that it made we sense to keep- bit. Mario Kart 8 and Deluxe are a huge discussion in their own, and maybe one we can come back to later, but do understand that the expansion on Deluxe was so good, it essentially satisfied an entire console generation of fans asking for Mario Kart 9 just by being eight but better. It's kind of impressive. Oh, and they put Marky Mark back in, so it's an S tier game. Wait, did you think the Wii U was going to have consistent quality in its spinoffs? Nope! Mario Kart 8 was the exception, not the rule! From here out, the Wii U's list of spinoffs are going to be, quite honestly, atrocious! Starting us off, we have Mario Party 10. For the sake of everyone's time, let's make it clear that for the most part, Mario Party 10 is almost identical to 9. Everyone is in a car, fixed to a linear path, trying to collect mini stars while playing pretty decent mini games. However, the new major mechanic to this game is that Bowser has shown up. Bowser has always had a presence in the Mario Party games, often being the occasional bully to show up and beat down any unfortunate player who lands on his tiles. So using the Wii U gamepad to create a five player mode where one of you gets to be Bowser and control him in all his unique minigames? It's a really great concept! However, that's all it is, a good concept. Because Mario Party 10 is a very linear title, the way that it works is that Bowser has to roll to catch up with the players. And whenever he does finally catch them, he forces them to play a minigame where failure will lose them some of their health points. Essentially, it's turning 9 and 10's boss battle modes into a multiplayer experience. However, it's just kind of lame. <laughs> I'm sorry. There are only five boards in Mario Party 10 total, with the majority of the game's content coming from a gameplay mode that very few people People seem to enjoy in the first place. And considering Bowser's party doesn't have any unique boards, only being able to play on a few of the main ones, and the gameplay isn't that much different nor much better than the original, it ultimately just comes off as a gimmick that never gets to be fully realized. I'm sure this mode can be fun with friends the first few goes around, but it doesn't have any lasting power. To make matters worse, Mario Party 10 launched along the Mario series line of Amiibo, which when scanned into Mario Party 10 would unlock a super watered down version of the classic Mario Party. Everyone runs around the board as little Amiibo figures fighting for coins to buy stars, not mini stars, the, the, the yellow ones. Except now you're on this stupid ass Monopoly square looking board with no thrills whatsoever. The idea was that each amiibo also came with its own board theme that could mix and match with the others. But instead of making these somewhat interesting layouts, they're just color swaps. Nah, just make them all a square so we can get them out for the quarterly report. For as much as I had to say about just how bad and weird 9 was, I don't have too much to say about 10, because it's just 9, but somehow less interesting. The only thing that I can get out of this that is worth mentioning is Rosalina. See, I told you it would be important. Did you remember? Did you remember when I told you to remember Rosalina earlier in the video? For the most part, it hasn't really been that big of a deal when a character gets inducted into the Mario group. The most important ones we saw this with were with Daisy and Waluigi. And then I guess over time, characters like Bowser Jr. and Diddy Kong became somewhat occasional mainstays, but it just felt so natural. 
but suddenly around the year 2012, Rosalina just started showing up at a fairly inconsistent basis, but from 2015 onwards, she, she's a mainstay. She's gonna be in all the games from now on. God, it feels like forever since we've had a simple non-sports oriented spin-off title to talk about. So what a change of pace it is to talk about Puzzles and Dragons Super Mario Edition. So the B&D series is essentially a combination of puzzle matching games turned into an RPG with unique characters, abilities, stats, etc. The game was released in the US as a combo pack with Puzzles and Dragons Z. I won't discuss too much on the B&D side of things, but the Super Mario Edition is pretty simple. You have eight worlds borrowing level aesthetics from the Super Mario series. The gameplay loop is honestly really similar to mobile games, which isn't anything too surprising considering Puzzles and Dragons got its start as a mobile game. To be frank, I haven't played much of this one yet. I've had the demo on my 3DS for like seven years at this point, and I've been meaning to get my hands on a legitimate copy because I really liked the demo. I will admit though that it does sometimes just feel like you're scrambling the board and things happen, but hey, I like the funny numbers going up. Not too much to say here. It's a fun puzzler that might be up your alley. Jesus, I wish all of them were that simple. Well, evidently they're not, because we have one of the most divisive sports games out there with Mario Tennis Ultra Smash. Regardless of this game's reputation, I'll try to keep it brief. As much as I'd love to make a feature-length film about this game alone with wacky side characters and running gags, I'm tired. I'm only going to have to trust that Adam did a decent enough job with the tennis section because Quite frankly, the best way to describe this game is tennis open, but way worse. No original court themes besides blue, orange, green, shroom, sand, ice, and uh-oh. Well, hey, at least there are less characters to choose from than on the literal handheld a generation ago, right? Well, who's new to the party? Sprixy? <laughs> Okay, well the roster is ass, the stages suck, there's no campaign in sight, or any minigame modes. Maybe the gameplay makes up for IO oh, JOY! The only thing this game has going for it is its mega battle mechanic. A toad throws a mushroom onto the field and you grow big, making your shots stronger. After a certain amount of time though, the toad throws a mushroom to your opponent's side of the field, making them bigger. If you both are powered up, your honor, then no one is powered up. This mode is stupid. Can you guys tell I have absolutely lost all my sanity from the start of this video? Remember when I was just like, oh yeah, he was in pinball. To be honest, it's been kind of hard to decide a ship from the golden era, given there have been some good games within the sea of duds, but I think this losing streak has gone on long enough. I'm going to say as early as 2012, with the release of Mario Tennis Open, was the ship from the golden era into the wasteland era. The Wasteland era essentially is where almost all originality, effort, and understanding of the property goes to die. Sure, you might find a few survivors scraping off of cans of beans, but for the most part, it's just bland, cookie-cutter, meh experiences across the board. Like, yes, these games are still playable and can be fun under the right circumstances, but almost all lose the drive to be something greater that the Golden Generation had. This isn't even a nostalgia thing either. Look at the amount of content and new gimmicks something like Power Tennis put forward, but compare it to Ultra Smash, it's just pathetic. All right, we are only just now getting past 2015 and this video is running on long enough. I'm telling you, it's nearing the runtime of Avengers Endgame and we don't even have fucking Spider-Man to show up at the end. So I think it's time we do another rapid fire of some smaller titles coming up. First of which, we're going to start with the Dr. Mario games, which there will be two of. Dr. Mario Miracle Cure for the 3DS in 2015 and Dr. Mario World on mobile devices in 2019. Miracle Cure is essentially a portable Dr. Mario RX that bolsters a few new mechanics, such as the Miracle Meter, a set of pre-made puzzle stages to complete, and being able to play as Dr. Luigi, L-shaped pills and all. Dr. Mario World, which is essentially the beefiest Dr. Mario game to date? There are a boatload of new modes and characters, each with their own unique mechanics that can be unlocked via playing the game or through, uh, well, uh, microtransactions. <laughs> While I of course would prefer a game that gives me all the content up front, I understand it's released in a mobile market, which it's just unfortunate that that's how these things have to be these days. I guess it's a little too hard to be mad at a game that has Dr. Goomba Tower in it. And while we're here, I'm going to keep this part brief. I essentially have no real opinions on any of the mobile games, so we're going to be skimming through them. Not only because I haven't really played any of them, but I kind of feel weird talking about them. 
Mario Run is, you guessed it, an auto runner. Dr. Mario is previously discussed, Dr. Mario with a boatload of content. And Mario Kart World Tour is a very simplified Mario Kart game that I actually did get to play a little bit of in high school, but mobile games are just super hard to talk about. I feel like I'd have to go on this long-winded tangent about microtransactions and start breaking down what is worth being paid for and the shifting climate of the video game industry, but to be honest, there are plenty of other videos on the platform that talk about that at length, and I just really don't feel like inserting that conversation into the video right now. Maybe I can come back to this at a future date and discuss these games at length. Because honestly, all of them seem to be quality titles. Let's keep moving though, with the release of Mario Party Challenge World. This was another arcade machine using Mario Party assets, this time from Night. This game is almost entirely played with a roulette table gimmick. While this machine was planned for a USA release, it was inevitably cancelled. Then, in 2017, we had the most recent Mario Kart arcade experience with GP VR. This is, simply put, the most basic arcade kart game we've covered thus far. The tracks are incredibly simple and limited in quantity, there are few items, with the gimmicks being you can reach out and throw them as you please, and you can't pick a character because, well, you are the character. I'm sure this is super fun, I mean, look at this guy. He's having a grand old time, but not much to say. Then next up, we have two particularly interesting games. Those being Mario Kart Live Home Circuit and Mario Bros. 35. So both of these games are pretty simple in concept. Home Circuit is this Mario Kart race car toy that you can control and drive around your house, where you are the ones that create the racetracks. While a novel concept that is as fun as the amount of effort you're willing to put into it, it's a really creative idea that has that stupid Nintendo charm to it. You're probably only going to get about an hour or two of enjoyment out of this, but it's still really fun. Then, with Mario Bros. 35, it's actually a battle royale game where you and 35 other players play through a predetermined set of levels, where enemies that you defeat are sent to other players' boards to deal with. It's honestly a really refreshing and hectic way to play through the first game. The main problem? It was a limited time release to celebrate Mario's 35th anniversary. Plenty have already said this already, but it was just kind of a really stupid time for Nintendo. They were doing this really annoying thing where some of their releases were only available for a limited amount of time. Most notably with this, Mario 35, and that Fire Emblem re-release. Looking back, it might have been to adjust for the recent events that were going on, given that it was 2020 when all this came out, but it still feels like a really lame way to make false scarcity. Anyways, the games were cool, but novel. Then finally, to finish trimming the fat here, though these are major games, we're going to be speeding through the Mario plus Rabbids games. These are essentially XCOM-based strategy games in the world of Mario and Rabbids being smacked together. The concept was stupid, and no one thought it was going to work when it was initially announced, but it surprisingly came around and blew everyone away. It's really fun to play, it's well designed, it has great writing, there's a bunch of cameos, and a boatload of content to chew through. Which begs the question, why are we skimming through them? Well, to be honest, I still want to play them. I have the first game and have got halfway through it, and I have been meaning to finish it for a while, but I just really haven't found the time. And these aren't quick three or four hour ventures, these games are an investment. So rather than spoil myself on researching them thoroughly, I'll leave you with the promise that I will return to these games in the future and do them the diligence they deserve. Maybe I can insert them into the Mario's Friends games, cause Mario's Friends are there. But anyways, enough jumping around. Let's move on to 2016 and all right, I'm gonna be perfectly honest here. I was ready to go into this and tear Mario Party Star Rush a new one with the same vigor that I did Island Tour. I remember when the gameplay was announced, it just looked way too different and was just shying even further away from what Mario Party was. Another misstep in the Mario Party franchise is all I took it for. So when I went to play it for this video, I actually ended up liking it a lot. So Mario Party Star Rush is by far the most different Mario Party game there's been at this point. Do any of you remember that free roam mode in Super Mario Party where you ran across the board not on a set path? And I can ask that question because chances are you've actually played that game. Well, that mode got its start in Star Rush. You and three opponents run around a semi-open board collecting coins and items, taking on a bunch of bosses like in Mario Party 9 and 10. You do this about three times a board and the person with the most stars at the end wins. Along the way, you can pick up actual characters to use on the board. Each ally like in Super Mario Party has their own unique dice and some extra modifier that can come in handy. Yeah, while there are a lot of reused aesthetics across the boards, there's a good amount of variety in the design, and weirdly enough, playing these boards also doubles as a makeshift single player mode, where you level up by completing each board. Alongside this, there's actually a really fun side mode called a... Uh, 
Essentially, you play a handful of minigames trying to collect as many coins as possible. Each coin you get in the minigame makes your character run one space further, where you and up to three opponents are basically running across the field trying to get back to the start first. What a fun spin on things. I can see why Super took a lot of elements from this game. And also, while it's not incredibly important, they have this gallery where they show off all the characters you encounter in the game with these cute little descriptions, and some of them are really funny. Like, come on, they don't even know what purpose Waluigi serves. Oh, and it also had Amiibo support. Color me surprised. While Star Rush is not a new peak of the franchise, I think there are a lot of really fun ideas at work here. And if you're going to do a Mario Party spinoff, this is how you should do it. Either stick to what works like they did with DS, or do something completely different and wacky like they did here. Not some weird middle ground with a car. You have a spinoff game for cars. Keep it over there. Maybe there's hope for the 3DS Party games. Or maybe there's a hundred reasons why that's not the case. Mario Party, the top 100 sucks. Did you see that coming? Were you sitting there an hour ago and thinking, oh man, do you think he likes Mario Party, the top 100? So you take 100 of the best Mario Party minigames, which by the way, who voted? I didn't see that on the polls in 2016. And instead of using all those really fun minigames that everyone loved from really fun board-based games, there's no board-based game! All there is are the mini-games. And look, I know I've talked a lot about how fun the side mini-game modes can be in the sports games and even some of the Mario Party games, but if all you have is the side mini-game modes, you, you don't have a game! Like, there's a single-player campaign mode where you play through each one of these mini-games at a time and you try to get, like, three stars on each one of them. Like, it's a fucking Angry Birds game. Maybe that's fun for some people, but I don't want to go walk up to an NPC, talk to them, go through a loading screen, play a fucking, like, 30-second mini-game, go through a loading screen, get the stars, and do it all again. Mini-games... Oh, my God. I can't believe I... I have to stand here and explain why mini games are important in Mario Party. <laughs> they are like the glue that holds the whole framework together. Or no, no, scratch that, Adam. Throw that off the screen. Mini games and the boards are a duality in Mario Party. You can't have one without the other. If you're just running around the board getting coins to buy stars, you've got the stupid amiibo game from Mario Party 10, which no one liked. And if you're just playing these short, 30 second mini games, what's the point? Yeah, that might be fun for a second, but you need stakes. It needs to be going towards something. So when you don't have one, it kind of just makes the other feel pointless. And also, this game came out in like 2020. The Switch was out. Who was looking to play Mario Party on their 3DS that year? And if they were, why is it still bad? <laughs> I'm sure this game has its fans. I, I, this is gonna be one of those games, dude, that I'm like in 15 years, a schmuck like me is gonna come on YouTube and be like, why Mario Party the Top 100 was actually a secret gem that didn't get a fair chance. No, it's stupid. I think it's stupid, so it's stupid. I'm the deciding factor here. I have 500 subscribers. Game's bad. We can move on. I was so, I was so sane at the beginning of this video, dude. And I'm not even playing this up for the cameras. I'm not trying to have an artificial arc throughout the video where I'm like, oh my God, I'm going crazy. I just literally feel unwell. <laughs> Mario Sports Superstars, just as bad. So Mario Sports Superstars is four games in one. Baseball, soccer, tennis, golf, and horse racing, I guess. Basically, soccer, baseball, golf, and tennis are all just extremely watered down versions of their original sports. I mean, golf and tennis are literally just their 3DS counterparts, but with less original content. Like, how do you wash down the 3DS golf game? That game was great! Okay, and then there was the horse racing, where there was this weird mode where you could groom your horse, which affected nothing in the game. It was just there to try to be a horse simulator. Who's gonna look at this render of Yoshi and think, damn it, I wanna groom my horse? Speaking of the characters, there was nothing interesting about this group. It was every single character you'd expect with only two unlockable characters. What are they? Metal Mario and Pink Old Peach. Then the game released with this weird line of amiibo trading cards to be like sports trading cards. And these were the laziest things ever. They were just a day in Photoshop 
taking original character renders from as early as Mario Party 4 and stitching them together. And again, this game released when the Switch came out. Why did they go through so much effort, yet not any effort at the same time? Okay, like, I know a lot of people made the argument that Mario Sports Mix did something very similar, where they took a bunch of other sports, made them pretty simple, and just threw them in a package all together. But I would go as far to say that that is not a fair comparison at all. Three out of the four sports in that game were brand new, and the one that returned, well, it was still really fun! It was made by the same guys who made the first one! And that game at least had a boatload of cameo characters, unlockable characters with costumes, colorful stages, good music, a freaking behemoth boss fight at the end of it? What does this game have? The Clay Court? It just was such a stupid release. It was a weird game to come out on the 3DS when the Switch had already been out. The content there was weak, it was confusing, and I, I just don't like it, okay? I, I just don't like it. And thus concludes 2017, otherwise known as the year where I just lost it. I, I pretty much lost it. Unfortunately for everyone here though, I have composed myself enough to continue with our regularly scripted program. Now we certainly have been on quite a ride over the past few hours, and astute viewers might have noticed that we're running out of time in this video's run. Which might be a little bit weird because we still hypothetically have six more years to cover. And well, aside from the fact we've done a handful of lightning rounds up to this point to trim some of the fat, it's important to note that these aren't the sole reasons that these releases were slowing down. Essentially, as we enter the Switch generation, the already present decline in quantity of titles only became much greater. While this shift started to rear its ugly head around 2012, Nintendo were still actively making content for two consoles at that time, one home and one portable. Now that we're on the Switch, they've formed those teams into one. Now one might hope that with all this extra focus over quality over quantity, we're gonna be having some good games coming up. And hey, there's only five games left to talk about, so why don't we just jump right into it? The final games we have to talk about are Mario Tennis Aces, Mario Golf Super Rush, Mario Strikers Battle League, Super Mario Party, and finally, Mario Party Superstars. Now as unorthodox as this might sound, I'm actually going to break these final games into two groups rather than cover them in chronological order. Starting us off with Super Mario Party. So after years of Mario Party just falling down an endless flight of freaking stairs like a Looney Tunes bit. It wasn't until 2018 when Nintendo finally got themselves together and gave us a classic Mario Party game. Sort of. So Super Mario Party is often viewed as a much needed return to form, but not much more than that? The game essentially brings us back to the golden age of Mario Party games, where we're running around collecting coins to buy stars, using items to boost our chances or meddle with other players, and playing some pretty good mini games at the end of each turn. But it wasn't perfect. Stars were half the price as they usually were, which in combination with the fact that items are now extremely cheap and second and third place are also given some pity coins, the economy was essentially broken. A small part of the other Mario Party games was getting enough coins to afford a star and deciding if you had enough in your budget to buy these items. But essentially when you have infinite money and everything costs barely anything, this element of the game is kind of non-existent. Then we also have to consider that there are only four boards total in the game, none of which have any remarkably cool gimmicks or visuals to entice players, and to make matters worse, it was still at this point that we had no online multiplayer in a Mario Party game. Sure, it would be added in an eventual update, when the game was no longer relevant and you could only play mini-games. Okay, this was a total jump thought that I didn't even write down, but as early as a month before this game came out, a game on Steam called Pummel Party came out, which was essentially online Mario Party multiplayer. So it's kind of ridiculous that this was done first by not Nintendo. So while Super Mario Party were it released back in the early 2000s would be lambasted as a terrible Mario Party game, we were so goddamn hungry for a basic, authentic Mario Party experience that we were eating like kings! 18 MILLION COPIES SOLD?! Of a game that has arguably less content than its DS equivalent?! This is TWICE the amount of copies sold as the second highest Mario Party game! That is insane! Now I know this sounds like a lot of bitching because quite frankly it is, but that's not to say that the game is bad. I really like the amount of characters with their custom dice blocks, and the free roam mode from Superstar returns and it's really fun. 
but like, seriously? While we are going over each gaming console's success in this video, let this be a note to you just how successful the Nintendo Switch is with games like this and Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. And with Super Mario Party, we can officially shut the book on the Mario Party losing streak, which led to three years later the release of Mario Party Superstars. So Superstars is essentially Super Mario Party, but just way better. You might be asking yourselves, how is that possible? I mean, didn't Super sell twice as many copies as Superstars? Well, Superstars essentially takes the idea of reviving the classic Mario Party games to a whole new level by literally using old minigames and maps to create a best of game. It's basically if Mario Party The Top 100 was an actual f***ing video game and not a hazy blur in the back of my common collective memory bank. Yeah, it's a collection of shit from a bunch of good games and of course that means it's going to be good. That's not to say it doesn't have its own little quirks though. There's an actual online multiplayer now, a level up system that can be used to buy little trinkets, and stickers! These things suck ass! Okay, so the idea of stickers were meant to be these cute little unlockables that you could use to emote during a Mario Party game. I imagine these were mainly designed for the online play, letting you kind of poke fun at the other players without having a microphone of some sort, but obviously this gimmick was going to be carried over to local multiplayer, which, no, <laughs> it's just so annoying. Because not only do these stickers take up a good amount of the screen, which can sometimes lead to them blocking important information, but they also make these stupid, annoying sound effects every time you use one. And I have never had a single Mario Party game where someone hasn't just been mashing one of those wait, stickers. Are those people are ever gonna watch people play this game? <laughs> wait, 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 hold on, I need to check. It's always Toadette, going, wah, wah. I want to blow my brains out. I'm praying if we see a Mario Party Superstars 2, that they either give us an option to disable these stickers or just straight up remove them, please. It, it makes me have a headache when I just want to play a good Mario Party game. Now, one might believe that with the Mario Party series finally getting a hold of itself, that means all the other sports games are going to as well. Because despite the fact that there were at least 15 different Mario spin-off series at some point in this video, we're down to Cars, Dice, and the Gym Locker. Which kind of felt like it was going to be the case with the release of Mario Tennis Aces. So Mario Tennis Aces was definitely an interesting release. The game was very clearly made reusing most of the assets from Ultra Smash, which, as we already know, but, 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 but it was surprisingly kind of good. The game brought with it a few new characters, a full campaign mode, some actually inspired stages, and wildly changed up the gameplay to be more than just run to the circle and press the button, freak show. It's not that hard. Characters now had their special moves like they did in Power Tennis, alongside a new time freezing and racket breaking mechanic. Between the two of these, it actually culminated into a very intense competitive game. I don't think I'm going out on too much of a limb to say that from a pure gameplay standpoint, this is probably the most fun Mario Tennis game there is. But this game just wasn't perfect. Well, yes, everything I've set up to this point has seemed very positive. That's only because for the past 10 years, I'm so used to mediocrity. If you are to step back and actually look at Tennis Aces and compare it from the amount of content and quality we got from Mario Power Tennis 14 years ago, there isn't really much to talk about here. Well, of course you can say that the visuals are an improvement. Let's talk about everything aside from that. For starters, while there are some actually inspired courses, which was something Ultra Smash was significantly lacking, there are only seven, and that's three less than the GameCube game. There's a campaign mode, which sure is a step in the right direction. It uses decade-old sound clips for its voice acting. Luigi! And arguably the most important thing to discuss are the characters. Yes, the game bolsters 16 playable characters, which I kind of feel bad repeating this, but is two less than Power Tennis. It did get 14 characters added over time as free post-launch DLC. At the time, this was super fun <gasps> cool. The game was already bolstering online tournaments and a gameplay loop that felt competitive enough for players to take to the leaderboards and hone their craft, even formulating tier lists for the characters for God's sakes. And a lot of people were on board with this. It was a practice that was keeping the game relevant and alive. The people who enjoyed the core gameplay were getting new characters added every few weeks, which kept the player base alive a lot longer than most Mario sports games would. But the emphasis is on people liked it at the time. 
because while this practice was good for the moment, this unfortunately taught Nintendo the worst lesson, which was, hey, we can rush our games out the door early and hold back content which should be in at launch and release it as post-launch support. It's the perfect crime! Alright, so full disclosure, I had originally recorded this section as a Joe Classic unscripted bit where I initially didn't have much to say other than it was a little bit worse than Tennis Aces. But after replaying this game to capture the footage, this game actually pisses me off more so than I thought it did. So let's skip the pleasantries. Like Tennis Aces, this is a fine golf game. The UI works, the courses are decently designed, and it functions. And while at first glance this game looks like it has all the makings of a good Mario sports game, it's actually one big stupid cheap fraud. So for starters, as always, let's look at the characters. The game at launch bolstered 16 characters, which surprisingly is the exact same amount both Toadstool Tour and World Tour launched with. So while I could argue this number should have been increased after the gap in years and horsepower, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt for about two seconds. Because looking at these post-launch characters, you start to see the cracks forming. The characters that were released were Toadette, Shy Guy, Wiggler, Koopa Troopa, and Ninji. Save for Ninji, all of these characters are some of the most basic ass inclusions a Mario game could have. Compare these to some of the banger DLC characters we got in World Tour like Rosalina and Nabbit. These just feel like characters that should have been in at launch, but were artificially held back to be trickled out as post-launch support. Which is further supported by the fact that I'm almost pretty sure all these guys were fully animated and modeled in the campaign mode. <laughs> So, Golf Super Rush also bolsters a full-fledged campaign mode. This shit fucking sucks, I'm sorry! It tries to simulate being like some big adventure by having this big open world hub you can run around in with one whole shop to explore. But god damn, this feels lifeless! The campaign is just an artificial set of tutorials, which I know it could be argued that Super Mario Slugger's campaign mode was just that, but at least in that game you were constantly unlocking new characters and modes by playing these puzzles and actually fun little mini games. What do you get to unlock in Super Rush? A total of like four different costumes for your me? It's just such a boring slog of a grind. But I know what you're all thinking. This game had the introduction of the Super Rush Speed Golf and Battle Golf modes. Shouldn't that knock the fun side modes qualifier out of the park? Oh, oh, whoa. These modes suck. Speed Golf just makes you realize how nice it is that other golf games just teleport you to the ball. And Battle Golf is a neat concept, but there are only two stages and they're aesthetically identical to one another. And the game mode is just way too fast for you to even enjoy what you're playing. The moment that you really start to have fun, it's already over. With little to no fanfare either, people just stand around at the end, clapping their stupid hands. I think what made both of these modes so disappointing is how much they were promoted in the marketing. Yes, both of these modes promo great, but when you go to sit down and actually play them, they're just kind of hollow experiences. It's like if Toadstool Tour was marketed as Mario Golf Toadstool Tour, the revenge of Petey. You put these expectations on these modes to be something groundbreaking, only to half-ass it and not go all the way. Another surprising gripe that I really haven't had too often were the animations. Not only does it feel like each character has one animation they use for god near everything in the game, but it's also just a massive downgrade from the previous title. Like, look at some of the animations from World Tour and Golf Super Rush put side by side. It's night and day. I'm even going to keep talking for a few moments longer so Adam can give you more examples. Yeah. Uh... Oh, and the golf courses at launch were awful. Yes, we'd eventually get courses like New Donk City and All Star Summit, but at launch, our level aesthetics were grass, 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 desert, grass but dark, and lava. Yeah, these courses looked fine, but they all amounted to just visually bland courses with like a single Mario element puked into them. Super Rush isn't a bad game, and on paper, it has everything it needs to, but it just lacks polish, care, and creativity that games of the past had. And I feel like Nintendo thought this game would succeed based off of the release strategy they did for Tennis Aces, but this game stopped seeing support over five months into the game because no one was playing the damn thing because the initial release was bare bones awful, which is starting to sound a lot like our third game in this little trilogy, Mario Strikers Battle League. Adam, you played this one, right? Why don't you go ahead and tell them what a scam it is? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, 
It's pretty good, actually. So while there's a glaring elephant in the room with this game, let's come back to that in a bit, shall we? Strikers Battle League is the third Strikers game now and on the Nintendo Switch. And to start with, my god, this game looks great. The visuals are stunning, the squash and stretch looks amazing, and the soundtrack is a rock and roll paradise. If not bordering copyright infringement from the Prince of Darkness himself. The gameplay is still frantic fun but has changed slightly here. No longer do we have captain support, we now just have our cast of characters and you pick four for a team. The team variety possibilities is endless, given each character's stat pool, where some are faster, some better at tackling, some are easier to score hyper strikes with. This however did not stop the Toad Army. There's also some really cool additions to the game like the gear system and the team tackle. The hyper strikes look better than ever and really make the game shine. Each one is so full of personality and energy and puts the goal into some sort of Dragon Ball Z style clash to try and save it. Unless you're Princess Peach, in which the goalie just rolls it straight in. Uh, speaking of Peach, I thought Nintendo was trying to make the gang more innocent and um, less thirsty. Why don't you go ahead and tell them what you really thought after playing more than 40 minutes? <sighs> but it's just not Strikers Charged. There's a lot of passion missing here. Mission mode is gone, cup mode is nothing like the Strikers Cup, stage hazards are gone completely, and the game just doesn't really cater to multiplayer, as every Kuiper shot freezes the screen for everyone, breaking the game's pace in half. And this is now the game has stopped seeing support. Before the six months of post-launch content, we only had a third of what the game offers now. Like with Tennis Aces, there's a lot of asset reusage as well, and a lot of sound effects and models are just completely recycled from previous games. It feels a bit empty compared to what made Strikers Charge feel so special. I think the core game is still a ton of fun, but if you were someone who bought the game at launch, I get where the disappointment comes from. The game by no means is a bad, unenjoyable experience, however, like the other two titles we just discussed, comparing them to their previous entries, you can start to see why fans just expected a bit more. Well, you certainly were a lot nicer than I would have been. Oh well, what can I say? I guess I'm just a softie like that. You want to say that again while soundtracking the rest of the video, buddy? Oh, for the love of f And believe it or not, folks, but that's it. Strikers Battle League is the most recent spin-off game we have to talk about. Well, at least the ones that fit this video. Which, while we're on the subject, I cannot express the amount of panic Adam and I felt watching through every Nintendo Direct in 2023 and just seeing all this new Mario content being made and it's somehow perfectly slotting into all the restricted categories we set up before we planned anything this far. But unsurprisingly, like a lot of you, I guess now that all the wahoos have passed and the dust is cleared, I think a lot of us are expecting some kind of grand takeaway or message from this whole video. And while I think there are many lessons to be taken, I think I have one that I like. We've seen some of the highest highs and the lowest lows from the series by now. Some bizarre attempts to capture niche markets, while also seeing Nintendo maybe get a little too comfortable in their formula. From bizarre crossovers, party games, kart racers, to shogi simulators, the Mario spinoff history is anything but boring. But where has this windy road led us? While it might feel anticlimactic to go out on a bittersweet do better as I shake my fist while clutching better games of the past in my other hand, I actually think there's more positive takeaways from this. Some of my astute Fred heads might have noticed that there was a final block on the timeline we created I had yet to reveal, which might be ominous considering we were still in the Wasteland era. But that's because I believe that the next era we're going to be entering is the Renaissance. Yes, games like Golf Super Rushed and Battle Squeeze might have been some mad titles that just seemed to miss the mark of the originals. I actually think Nintendo is finally starting to recognize what makes these games so great. And it's the first time I think this in a really long time. In the year 2023 alone, we got the announcement of two faithful and clean remakes of Super Mario RPG and Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, alongside some other titles like a return to form of a more traditional WarioWare game, and a brand new Princess Peach game for God's sake. I know we didn't really talk about her, but the last time we got that was like on the DS 15 years ago or something. And if Nintendo can learn to change their release strategy off of one game's success, I believe they can learn from a few game shortcomings as well. This isn't even mentioning that in the past two years, we've seen consistent releases of Mario Kart 8 Deluxe's booster courses, which are an excellent example of doing post-game release DLC right. Then you throw in Mario Party superstars into the mix and you've got yourself some modern day classics that while they are essentially being carried by reusing the old game's material, has to get the point across that we liked what they were doing in the golden era. So what kind of games do I expect from the Renaissance era? Well, I think some essentials would be a Mario Kart 9 and either a Mario Party 
Superstars 2 or just straight up Super Mario Party 2 because I think that game was really good. Then you throw in a Fortune Street sequel because God, that game has a cult following at this point. That series is still going but just leaning towards other IPs. I think when the Switch 2 comes out, it would be an excellent fit. Then after that, of course, you gotta get some sports games in there. So how about something we haven't done in a while? So let's make a new baseball and basketball game. Then finally, give us something entirely new. I don't care if it's a weird puzzler like Pit Cross or something as goofy as another rhythm game. The early years of this franchise showed just how goddamn versatile this guy can be. And I think the limits of his universe are far outside the parameters of just sports and party games. But even if none of these games get made, I'm very hopeful for what's to come. And I'll be sure to keep up with the releases. Maybe after enough time has gone by, I can do kind of an update to this video. But in the meantime, I'm just really excited to tackle the RPGs or side series. So if we can somehow get to 10,000 subscribers by the end of the year, Adam and I will come back and make the ultimate Mario RPG retrospective. But before I break off into shilling, let's get into what probably a lot of you have been waiting to see, and that's the top 10s. Let's start off with the top 10 worst here. Leading the charge, we have number 10, Mario Strikers Battle League. Number nine, Mario Party 5. Number eight, Mario Teaches Typing. Sorry, Adam. Number seven, Mario Clash. Number six, Mario's Time Machine. Number five, Mario Party 10. Number four, Mario Golf Super Rush. Number three, Mario Tennis Ultra Smash. Number two, Mario Sports All-Stars. And number one, Mario Party the Top 100. And before the bricks start flying through my window, let's get to the top 10 best. At number 10, we have Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Yeah, I'm sorry, that probably should be higher based off of quality, but I just haven't played it that much. Number nine, Mario Party DS. Number eight, Mario Party 7. Number seven, Mario Sports Mix. Number six, Super Mario Party. Number five, Mario Party 8. Number four, Mario Kart Double Dash. Number three, Mario Kart Wii. Number two, Mario Super Sluggers. And number one, Mario Party 6. And the ultra S tier number one game of the video and in my top 10 of all time, that's right. It goes to Fortune Street, baby, that's right. This was never about the budgie plumber and his stupid little friends. This was a thinly failed Dragon Quest video the whole time. <laughs>